recording. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Outlier Podcast number 21, um, the only podcast in the DFW area where we talk to people that are really, really interesting. I think the guy that I have in the podcast is, is interesting today. Uh, but first off, uh, I wanted to plug some stuff. So this, uh, this podcast was produced and mastered at Audio Badger Studios. Uh, you can find them facebook.com uh, slash Audio Badger Studios. Bryce Dobula is your guy. Uh, if you like how this thing sounded, then uh, go hit him up. Uh, and you can follow me on social media at JohnMan5000 on Twitter, s- Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and probably Twitch and various other stuff. Uh, my guest today is a stand up comedian and he runs an open mic host, or he's a host of an open mic. And his name is Colton Jones, and he's really cool. It's going to be a really awesome podcast. Colton, hello. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good. Plug your stuff, my friend. Okay, well, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at local sex symbol, all one word, all lowercase. I don't think you have to say all lowercase on the Instagrams and the Twitters. Maybe it's one of them is. Anyway, you go to that. It's local sex symbol. Uh, on Facebook, I'm Colton Jones. I don't, you know, that's my name. So it's my name on Facebook. And, uh. You know, follow those. I just recorded a, a live album that's coming out soon. So follow those. You'll know when to get it. Because I don't know the release date right now. That'll definitely be in the uh, in the podcast thing. So without further ado, Bryce, cue the music, my friend. Levels look really big, and your levels look really small. This is kind of far from me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he set the he set the thing to where you could be right up on the pop filter. There you go. Maybe like that. Just don't get any of your cold on it. Oh, it will. Okay, it's already on there. Okay, good. Just so we know. Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, Colton, uh, thank you for coming. This is gonna be really fun. I'm super excited. Uh, yeah. You recording? Yeah, we are. He uh, he he. Got it rigged up to where I can hit the insert button, and it'll just, like, show him where to put the music in. So, oh, sweet. Yeah, that's cool. But, uh, so, intro questions. I wanted to introduce the, my audience to who you are. Um, yeah. I already said you're a stand-up comic, but, like, where did you grow up? I grew up, well, I was born, I was born in a trailer park, Keller, and then at some point I lived in Rome in a big house, and then I lived in a smaller house again back in Watauga. Uh, which is really close to Keller. So I'm pretty much just from Keller. Um, And then I moved to Denton to go to college, and I started doing stand-up here. And I've been here for three years now doing stand-up. What did you go to college for? I went to Texas Women's University for uh, acting and directing. Oh, okay. Did you graduate? Uh, I have 12 hours left on my degree, and there's a $1,000 block on my account before I get back into school. Oh, okay. So you're about like two grand away from graduating then? (laughs) Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, that sucks. Um... Uh, what was it like when you first started comedy, my friend? Like, um, well, when I first started, I was really just kind of like ripping off Andy Kaufman for the first year I was doing stand-up comedy. Uh, I would just go in and I would do really elaborate bits. I would play characters. I wouldn't do any like jokes. Um, and I remember a lot of like I would uh, stage fights at the open mics, and uh, I worked a lot with uh, local guy Taylor Higginbotham. Of the Brave Boys, worked with him a lot. Um, the first like successful bit I had that like you know people really responded to was 
I was I would play Taylor's therapist and I would bring him up on stage and say, hey, you know, he's in therapy right now. So try to be nice to him. And then uh, after that, I, I did that at the Denton Comedy Festival. And then I started doing more, I guess, traditional stand up, uh, more joke based, uh, you know, um, for about the next two years. And uh, that's what I've been doing. I don't really know. I guess a lot of people didn't really like my stuff when I first started doing stand up, but uh, nobody likes anybody's stuff when they first start doing stand up because you're, I mean, everybody's objectively bad the first, like, you know, I think Mark Barron says it's 10 years, but it's probably, you know, I don't even think I'm really good yet, but I'm, you know, I'm pretty good. I know what I'm doing, I feel like. Yeah, you're, you're like developing uh, confidence, yeah. your writing's getting better. Yeah. And you're hitting, you're hitting a ton of mics all the time. Yeah. I remember when I first started doing stand-up, people would ask me, like, how I came up with jokes, and I would, like, roll my eyes or not have an answer for them. I thought it was a frustrating question to ask a comic. Right. But now I can, like, if somebody asks me how I come up with material or whatever, I do have, like, processes that I follow, and I have, like, a, you know, theory on how I approach it. Yeah. Or whatever, which that's, is something I didn't have early. I was just trying to get a reaction out of people. Right. See, that's interesting because, like, uh, when I had Matt McElhone on, we were talking. I don't know if we said this on the podcast or off air. We've definitely had this conversation where it was like, like, hey, there's there's a handful of pet peeve questions that you that professionals can get asked. Like, oh, how'd you get started? What'd you do? Like, like what? How do you do this? Yeah. And uh, like, I legitimately like when I first started writing comedy. I didn't have a process, and then now I kind of, um, you know, I, I, I'll I'll reverse engineer like some other comics joke and figure out okay how did he do this, and then how can I take that formula and change it so I'm not ripping his stuff, but then like kind of not necessarily want to rip a comic, but I want to understand how formulas work so I can write my own formula. Well, I mean, who I, there's some quote by somebody who wrote a couple books or something, and it's like you know, real creativity is just. Uh, our real originality is just stealing from a billion different things instead of one thing. Dude, I feel like that's a uh, Mark Twain. Is that Mark Twain? I'm, it might be. It sounds some Mark Twain it does, shit to say. Yeah, it does. The the, <laughs> the snide little bastard. Yeah, it yeah. Was. But uh, yeah, man. Uh, writing comedy is definitely uh, uh, like I, I I bought this this comedy writing joke, and this guy was talking about just like English writing in general, and he's like, if you're if you're writing for speech. Uh, like, you know, one of the one of the tricks that you can do is uh, like every time you take a pause, start a new line. Mm-hmm. You know, and he, he took like the Mitch Hedberg, uh, the smack of the frog joke or whatever, and he yeah. broke it down. And each time he took a pause, it was like a new line or whatever. And he was yeah. like, "There's also a, like a ratio of like four to one. Like for every four lines of setup, you have to have a punchline, otherwise the joke sucks." Yeah. Um. But, uh, you know, I don't know whether or not that's been tested or that's true. And I'm sure it's different with everybody because everybody's comedy is different. But, right. yeah, there's definitely a... Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's kind of like with theater, you know, I grew up studying acting. One thing, you know, like the fourth wall exists, but it also doesn't. And the way you break the rule of the fourth wall is part of what's effective about the format of theater. And I feel like comedy has the same elements like there are definitely like tips and tricks and like rules or like you know uh, techniques that i've picked up from other comics by talking to them but if i were to like do that formulaically you know like i mean you can see open micers that write good like creative jokes with like a lot of wordplay right and they can just spit it out and have it all memorized and still not funny because there is no authenticity to it right and it's like if you're not I just think with stand-up, you know, the rules really exist to be broken kind of more than most other art forms. Yeah. Maybe like visual art is on the same level. I of. think, uh, you know, I, I, I studied drawing for a long time. And uh, when I was a kid, I, I had like the Stan Lee copies of how mm. I draw superheroes. Yeah. And one of the rules that they were, they, one of the things the guy was saying was like, yeah, you have to understand human anatomy to the point where like you're on the level of at least being able to draw stick figures that Michelangelo could work with. You know oh. what I'm saying? When I was in high school, my theater teacher convinced me to take an anatomy class because it would help me like know my body on stage. Oh my god, I failed that class, and uh, <laughs> that was not good advice. I didn't learn. Any- I mean, I'm you know maybe I didn't learn because I failed the class, but yeah, I just didn't see how any of it was applicable. Yeah, not not everybody's uh, not everybody you know, like every learning method is applicable apl- applicable blah, 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 to everybody else. But for drawing, for sure, it helped me. Uh, and then after you learn the rules, then you understand why 
you can break them yeah. without getting in trouble. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, that's kind of what I've been searching for in my comedy writing is like, hey, I, I just need some structure and some rules so I can get, you know, comfortable yeah. and then and then and then go explore or whatever. But yeah. that's that's kind of what I've been doing. I have a I have a joke where, uh, like, I I make lists and then like at the end of these lists, like they get they get progressively more like crazy and then I throw a twist in at the end, and like the twist is like you know something that everybody else isn't expecting and it's like a funny one liner and it. It, it hits. Yeah. Uh, and I got that from like listening to uh, Kill Tony podcast where they just have like a bunch of open micers go up and, and uh, you know, do their stand up and then they, they rip in. You're, you're familiar with Kill Tony. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. But for everybody that's listening, Kill Tony podcast, if you want to get into comedy, is like perfect. Matt McElhone was the first guy that, that I talked to about getting into stand up because I yeah. was a fan of his before I started doing it. And uh, he was. When I when I actually went up on stage, I was like, "Dude, what podcast should I listen to?" And he was like, "Kill Tony. That's yeah. that's the best one to do." Um, so that's cool. Uh, so what were your what were your influences in terms of like comedy? Well, like I said, you know, the first year I was doing stuff, I was really just ripping off Andy Kaufman, and I still kind of play with that stuff sometimes, um, especially like not related to stage. Like if I'm doing something on the internet, you know, I think Andy <laughs> is a good person to look at for how to like approach that i'm not gonna lie i didn't recognize the name i don't know who that is oh the jim carrey made a movie about him okay which is kind of the best way to learn his life story but he was this weirdo comic he was on saturday night live in uh and taxi and his stand-up bits were really really kind of like um um you know subversive and he would you know do stuff like one time he went on david letterman and he did this whole monologue about how he'd just gotten fired from SNL, which he had in real life. And he started begging the Letterman audience for change. Like yeah. He's walking out into the audience, like opening up his pockets, asking them for change. Yeah. And he didn't tell Letterman he was going to do that. He, that was his whole thing is he never told anyone he was going to do it. He had a really long feud with Jerry the King Lawler in the WWE. Okay. Because Andy went into the WWE as a women's wrestler. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe you don't know about that. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Yeah. I just pulled him up, y'all. He's the crazy weirdo, like, uh, uh, from Taxi. He's, he's like, the foreign guy that doesn't speak English. I think everybody but you knows who Andy Kaufman is. Oh, yeah, my bad. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I had no idea who he was. Yeah, he's fucking hilarious. I'm the worst. <laughs> Another big favorite of mine is uh, Maria Bamford. Okay. Um, I saw her live recently, actually. It was the best live stand-up performance I've ever seen. Uh, you know, um... She's really, really funny. She plays with voices a lot. She's really good at just, like, switching on dime, doing a different voice. Yeah. She's real, real clever. Um, she does, like, longer stories. She has the same uh, – I am I have bipolar disorder. She has the same diagnosis as me. Yeah. Um, she have the same number and everything? Yeah. It's that, the same. I mean – That's cool. Because there's, there's one and two, I think, One right? and two, yeah. It's like the, one is – It's like diabetes. One is – I know a couple comics in the DFW who have one, and uh, me and John Brown are the tours. I think Matt – is one. Oh, yeah. maybe I shouldn't have said that. He's a really good friend of mine. Oh no, he he has bits about it on stage. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he can get over himself. If so he's one is you have also he's short. You have really really long periods of mania where you like can't really control your actions and your like thinking is hyper distorted. So right. it like, doesn't even um, your emotions are haywire and they dictate everything that you do. Yeah, and yeah. They're always normally negative. I imagine. Yeah, there's a lot. Well, uh, sometimes mania can be really really pa- pa- like empowering yeah. but like not in healthy ways like maria bamford has a joke where she talks about you know oh i stayed up till three in the morning like scrubbing my baseboards but hey you know whatever you know i'm, I'm getting what i can out of it right and uh, <laughs> something like that uh life gave me lemons and i'm going to make math with them yeah <laughs> absolutely she uh she uh has a show on netflix that she like was put in a psych ward she was doing ads for target and i think she had a mental breakdown because she's considers herself you know, far left socialist. And she like just was so mad at herself for working for this company that she didn't had no respect for. She lost her shit in Hollywood and uh, went to a psych ward for a few months and then came back out and tried to get back into the business. And now she's having a really, really successful career. I mean, right. she has a Netflix series about yeah. all this and it's called Lady Dynamite and it's the best Netflix original series to me. It's actually directed by Mitch Hurwitz from Arrested Development. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll check that out for sure. Yeah. And then another comic that I really liked early on, like before I was doing stand up, when I was still acting and like in high school, I would listen to Patton Oswalt every day. Like really? I would listen to the same bits over and over again 
I love Patton. Dude, I've never heard any of his stand-up stuff, but I love everything that I've ever seen him in. Oh, he's a great stand-up. He's one of the great stand-ups of like the 2000s and 90s. Dude, he's, he's, he's another one of those dudes that has like a thousand voices, too. Yeah. Yeah, he does voices. Uh, his aren't in his stand up. His voices aren't as pronounced. He's much more of like a storyteller, and he'll go on and on about how much you know how, his politics and like you know he's one of those guys that uh, really is not afraid of like you not liking him because right. of what he thinks. He's very far uh, left, although you know not as far as he wants to be. It's kind of funny sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's some guys on the right as well that that kind of feel that like they come from that. I don't really care. Yeah. What you think of me, camp? Like uh, Ted Nugent for sure. Yeah. Uh, um, there's a handful of characters. The president, uh, handful of characters on the right that kind of come from that same. I mean, you know, when you have a public image, it's yeah. not going to match. Like your matrix brain is different than your like PR image. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that can be really challenging. It, it seems like the guys that own it are the ones that that like don't get owned like jack nicholson that was like uh, i was talking to somebody actually used to hang out with him quite a bit john i don't got a name drop but uh, i ran into this guy and we were talking uh about like you know hanging out with jack nicholson and hunter s thompson and whatnot and uh he was like when the in the 70s when all of they had like their own version of like the me too movement or whatever where they were trying to get rid of people that were on drugs and and going into prostitutes or whatever and nicholson came out before anybody said and was like yeah i'm I, I got a hooker in my room almost every night, and I do coke, and I, I really don't care what whatever. Well, it's and, a lifestyle, right? And uh, it, it, there was no, there was never any Jack Nicholson fiascos. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Because he didn't try to hide it. Uh, Morgan Freeman had had one. I guess he got busted cheating on his wife or something yeah. like that. But uh, which sucks because Morgan Freeman's like, well, he like there was like seven different complaints that came from different movie sets about him like finding an intern. Oh just really? Like, yeah, like following her around, slapping her on the ass a lot. Oh really? Yeah, and he would always, uh, he he always had like costume. You know, there was a story about him getting his costume measured, and he like made the costume girl like, you know, <laughs> kind of like terrible. push turtling. Like. Not funny, but it is. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's like you know people will have power do that kind of shit. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that's what like uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah, you know, which is sad. You know, I don't want to think about that because I want to be famous. Right. You know, uh, Javoris James in their comic, he has a bit about. Uh, I, I don't remember what musician it is, but he find uh, people found out that he was having his mates feed him while he was having sex. Right. And Javoris has the bit is like, well, I don't even know why I want to be famous if I can't do shit like that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it's funny because it is like that is like kind of dehumanizing to do to someone to be like feed me while I fuck somebody in front of you. But right, it's like. Also, that's the kind of shit that like famous people do. Well, that's like, what power Genghis Khan drunk. was doing for sure. Yeah, and it's like <laughs> there is it, it just happens. You know, he had a he had a uh, a hog leg winch. And, not that uh, I think it should. I'm not winch. like standing by it anyway. I want to clarify. It's awful if you do it. If right. you feel like you're going to do that to someone, you should immediately seek therapy. And Unless get that person's into of. it, I feel like. Maybe. Well, if they're into it, then it's not bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole. That's the rule. If yeah. they're, if they're into it, it's not bad. That's yeah. the line. But yeah, I mean, once you once you get into that mindset, it's like uh, uh, it's it's like I am the king and I am on top of the world, and who doesn't want to do this with me? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Well, yeah, I mean, and it, you know, I don't know. That's why I always say that uh, Kim Kardashian and Kanye West, their yeah. relationship makes total sense. To right, because they're both like, yeah, that makes sense to me too. And I people hate complain that I know, about that. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, well, those people don't really love each other. They're just both famous. And I'm like, yeah, but think about what it's like to be famous and how, like, remember Britney Spears 07? Like, I know that society had no respect for her at that time. By the way, one of the great failures of American society in the 2000s was the way we treated Britney Spears when she was clearly going through something very bad. We should have been more supportive of her. I just ignored her. I just uh, I just think, you know, people made a lot of fun of her, and was, that was really ugly. I was listening to uh, <laughs> Slayer and, like, Black Sabbath at the same time that she was going through that. So yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't relate. I, I'm so fascinated with celebrity in the way it like affects people. Right. Um, Psychology of it anyway. You know, I mean, people, uh, there have been like reports, you know, like uh, named sources saying that Trump is in mental decline. Omarosa said something about that. And it's like, I don't know if he has, I do think that he is clearly like becoming more of whatever he is as he gets older. Like yeah. he's just turning into this warped and warped version of Donald Trump. Yeah. You know? Uh, but I think that that's probably because of how famous and powerful he's been the whole time. Yeah. Um, you know, he's definitely been in the spotlight since he was in his thirties. Every bit of behavior that he has showed that people complain about has been reinforced his yeah. whole life. Yeah. You know I mean? Like literally you can talk about the access Hollywood tape. Like he's on tape 
bragging about sexually assaulting people. Yeah. And because it didn't affect him, he's like empowered to just continue to act like that. Yeah. And the the thing is, is he he like he owns it, and it, and he owns up to it. Like I, I'm pretty sure he went out and made an apology about that. He's like, yeah, I shouldn't have said it. My bad. Yeah. You know, it's just hard. I don't do that shit anymore. I know I hate him on a <laughs> on a pretty personal level because I really don't like him. Right. But you know, it's hard to give people the benefit of the doubt when you feel like they argue in bad faith constantly. Yeah, um yeah, cuz you feel like they're going to take advantage of you if you if you, yeah. you know, turn the other cheek or whatever. Yeah. I, I can I can respect that. I definitely like I like Trump a lot more than you do, for sure. He wasn't my he wasn't my first case and I was disappointed when he won the the primaries, but at that point I thought um it's it's Trump or Hillary and like one of them is a is a is a, you know, uh uh puppet of the 1% and another one is a puppet of his own making. So <clears throat> and we'll get into that later. Actually, I have that question prepared towards like the end. I want to kind of get into like the political stuff towards the end. But I thought you and I could kind of riff, riff on, um, you know, just the corporate stranglehold that our daily lives are. Oh, we don't live over. in a democracy. It cracks oh. me up when people complain about I mean, I want it to be a democracy. You know, it's built on the idea of people having a voice, but we live in an oligarchy. Like, we are run yeah. functionally by money. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about Donald Trump is, is that he said that in the campaign. Yeah. And people are like, well, how did he win? And it's like, because Hillary doesn't, didn't want to say that. And yeah. she is a, you know, it's the, it's the Bill Clinton syndrome. It's like, you, she's such a politician. She yeah. sounds so like planned when she talks yeah. that no matter how far left her platform went, she wasn't going to like capture the imagination of leftists. And I think, uh, and, and I'll play devil's advocate uh, on the left, uh, for Clinton. Um, if you, from, from what I understand was, uh, she didn't want to play ball and that's how come Obama got the, uh, the nomination instead of her back in like 2008 because, you know, all the corruption or whatever that goes on in the DNC, but she, she wanted to kind of go, into like her own thing and be like your own little superhero or whatever. And they were like, Obama's going to play ball. You're, yeah. You're just crazy. And then she went on 180 from that this, this time around and people had had enough of, I mean, well, I say people, but like the, the seas of empty space that won out over the, <laughs> over the, yeah. the 50% of the population that lives in like a 15 mile radius of each other. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, um, they just, we, they'd had enough, man. Like, and rightly so. Like, uh, I was, I'm reading this book called Bullshit Jobs, where this guy's talking about like 80% of the jobs in, in the U.S. are just complete nonsense that can be automated. Like, corporate lawyers, there's no reason for a corporate lawyer to exist. Um, like, well, you know, one thing that I've been reading about is the is this Paul Manafort and Michael Cohen proceeding that's going on right now. A lot of people are arguing, like, People, we know that people commit these crimes, these campaign finance violations. Like this right. happen all the time. Obama was fined for one in two thousand eight. Oh, was he really? It wasn't as severe as, uh, you know, paying off a porn star. Right. You know, um, but he there was something like, I don't even remember what it was, but he did. He had a campaign finance violation, and they were charged with it, and he they fessed up to it, and they paid a fine on it. It's like right. thirty thousand dollar fine. That's crazy. But white collar crime, like what Paul Manafort was getting into, yeah. that's like the most common thing in America. Yeah, and it never gets prosecuted because we, that would not be good for the United States. Like it's not, it wouldn't be good for us to shut down all the money laundering that happens at the top well, half of society. That, and I, I feel like a lot of people don't understand it. Like some rich guy got in trouble for moving a zero over into the one column. I don't, hell. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like it's that, something that you know. It doesn't. It's hard to correlate how it directly affects you, right. but it does. I mean, corruption is like when you look at the reason governments have been criticized and collapsed over time, over like human history. Corruption is always an element, and right. like every downfall of every. Right. I mean, it happened in Rome. Yeah. You know, it happened in you know uh, the Soviet Union. They, there was corruption at the top. That uh, yeah, from the beginning, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you ever check out that creature from Jekyll Island book I told you about? Oh, I don't think so. I got a copy of it. I'll, I'll, I'll actually give it to you. Do you read? You want to pause it? I'll read the whole thing and we'll just keep recording. Uh, okay, yeah, hold on. We're, we're gonna pause real quick, <laughs> and we're back. Anyhow, uh, the uh, the there were like three or four different um, uh, socialist revolutions that happened within a couple of years of each other before uh, Lenin showed up, and uh, Lenin was like the only one that was funded by like the New York banking cartels at the time which is how come he was successful like he, he showed up with arms and and it, it, like it, it, his campaign from the beginning was almost from the beginning was like corrupted the guy probably started with like hey maybe we shouldn't be 
you know, slaves to this one guy and their corrupt family that just like, you know, does Europe's bidding or whatever. But yeah, anyway, I yeah, go off. I mean, I can't. I don't know about that. Yeah, I'm not gonna call you out on something that you don't know about. That's unfair. So, uh, or not call you out, but like grill you on something. Uh, so, how long have you you you've been doing comedy for? Three years then. Three years. A little okay. bit over. And it's all been in DFW. Uh, Denton mostly. Yeah, I've worked in DFW a little bit. I've worked. Uh, you know, I did a couple showcases at the Improv in Arlington, and uh, that's it. Okay, <laughs> I did. Uh, I did Mana's mic last night. The uh, Twilight Lounge in yeah. Fort Worth. I featured on, on that Tuesdays. Last week. Did you really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't been there in a while, and I had a really good set. I was really pleased. Like, uh, but it, it's just so far away, and my car is a piece of crap. Yeah. And, well, I don't have a car, you know. Right. I uh, I just try to find a ride with someone, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I'm about to start doing. I'm starting like yeah. going. I've been whatever. doing stand up since I recorded my album, though, because I'm kind of trying to cut down on my drinking. I'm still doing uh, my Monday, my kind of my house gig or whatever, just because. But um, yeah, man, I'm trying to quit drinking. That is an interesting thing because I'm trying to do the same thing. It's really hard to go to a really bar. hard not to drink it. Yeah, open mics. It's easier for me when I'm doing them on like because I do them on. You know, my lunch break. Yeah. A lot of times. Uh, There's no way you could. You know, especially like going to the club because they'll like, they want you to buy drinks and yeah. you'll get treated better if you buy a lot of drinks while you're there. That and you're there for six hours. Yeah. Waiting to go up. That's like you want a fucking vodka Sprite so you can sit there for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to start bringing my laptop and doing like, editing stuff at the clubs. Yeah. They'll so get mad at you though if you didn't send the room. You got to do it out in the lobby or something. No. Oh, yeah. 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 I'll do it in the lobby. It's fine. But, um, yeah. So you you run your own open mic. Yeah. How long have you been doing that? This one's only been going for about three or four months now. But I had one before in Deep Ellum that didn't wasn't as good. Uh I got I got paid all right. But you know, I would go out to Deep Ellum and I would do that show and it would be hard to get people to show up and I'd be in such a miserable mood by the time I was over that I'd go to a bar in Deep Ellum and fucking spend the hundred dollars they paid me because Right. I you know. Yeah. It's just alcoholism man <laughs> yeah. well i remember the you know the only uh the only time i've ever gone to a strip club in my life i uh i don't actually think i'm supposed to tell this story because the guy i was with his girlfriend explicitly does not know about it but whatever that's yeah. dumb uh <laughs> tell your girlfriend you went to a strip club if who's you that guy club. anyway uh exactly. Luke Moore, no, he just moved to san francisco nah, nah, nah. yeah i called him out i don't care <laughs> One time we were uh, we we did the show and he would give me a ride out there because I didn't have a car and I'd pay him twenty five dollars and then uh, I'd pay him twenty five dollars to get me right out there and hang out and uh, sometimes I'd pay him fifty to guest host the show because I wasn't feeling it because it was just horrible every week it was right. just hard to sit through and uh, and that's my fault it's because I wasn't doing a good job promoting it because I didn't know what the f I was doing yeah but w- one night we got paid and the bartender uh, he goes. <laughs> We it was just so long. We were there for like three hours, and he, the guy there was nobody there the whole time. Right. But I was like, there was like five people, and I let them all do just as much time as they wanted to. And this one guy did like thirty minutes, which is my bad too. But I'm not about to give somebody five minutes and then only do twenty five minutes of work, and then be like, okay, give me a hundred dollars. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. So I just stretched it out, and it was it was awful. And I went up to the bartender, and he's like, "Well, I didn't make enough money tonight to pay you. Give me one second. So he goes into the office of the place and he walks out with a, a fucking bank stack of ones. Yeah. That's $100. And he was like, here you go. And uh, I was like, that's funny. We got all ones. And then uh, the bartender goes, yeah, you should go to a strip club. Yeah. And, you know, like I said earlier, I'm bipolar. So I have like clinical impulsivity. Like it, it's really hard for me to say no to right. like proposals of activities. So. I was like, you want to go to a strip club? And Luke was like, yeah, let's go. And then I just had the worst experience I've ever had in my entire life. Because it's a Monday night. It's Monday night. Right. And it was like 11 o'clock when we went to the strip club. In and the this morning? girl. Oh, at, at night, duh. Yeah. Sorry. And this girl that I went to high school with walked up to me, recognized me. She goes, have you ever been to a club before? I said, no. She's like, well, I'll give you your first dance for free. But you uh, want to go upstairs to this private room. It's really good. You get a wristband and you get a second for free dance yeah I was like, okay <laughs> i'm trying to like just enjoy this yeah and she just like dry humped me for 20 minutes you know through two songs and then it was, she was like do you want another dance i was like no no <laughs> not really i don't I really don't and then uh yeah i went downstairs and luke was having 
um, pretty much the same experience with one of the strippers. But I remember he he like he was at a table. He hadn't gotten a private booth, right. and she was like on top of the table, like you know, shaking her butt, right? And as they do, as they're paid to do, right? And uh, which no judgment, by the way. Sex work is real work. I'll, I'll definitely judge them. I'll judge them for you. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Shame. Um, but <laughs> I need a bill. <laughs> we left, and I remember I turned to Luke, and I was like, "So why'd you pick that girl? Like, why'd you?" What? And he's like, "She looked like." His girlfriend. <laughs> so he went to a strip club and just found a stripper that looked like his girlfriend. And I was like, why do people come to these things? Yeah. Well, it was horrible. Dude, you could have just like went home. And yeah, like, I hey, know. And then like I see. I'm try something new. You, you're like there and you're like watching these other tables interact with like the dancers. And they're like slapping their butt. And like my whole life, I've never been in a strip club. And I was like, what the fuck are these guys doing? They're not supposed to do. But turns out you can in, in Texas. You can like slap them on the butt. Oh, really? Yeah. You yeah. just can't like gr- like grope. Yeah. But you can like if the if the dancer says you can slap, then you can slap. What yeah. happens if uh, she says you can slap, but you have like like a bear claw kind of hand? So like when you go to slap, like your hands already kind of cupped. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like 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 your hand kind of like kind of grabs it just from the slapping motion. You know? I don't know. You know, I don't run a strip club. I wonder. I'm gonna have to find a stripper and ask her that. It was really bizarre. Have, yeah. you, have you been to a club? No, I've actively avoided them. Yeah, they're. They're awful. Yeah. And you don't feel good about yourself. No. I, you know? Yeah. But I stopped calling myself a feminist after that day. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Probably for the best. Yeah. You know, if I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I was self-professed. Now I'm like, I'm not even, you know, I want to be, but I'm not trying to fuck with calling myself that. Cause... Well, you, there's a difference between, you know, professing to be a feminist and, and then just, you know, not being an asshole towards women and women's issues. I feel like, Yeah. you know, uh, and uh, I hate to. You know, uh, rock the boat or whatever. Well, I don't really care about rocking the boat, but I, I will say that uh, there's a lot of people that feel that um, just the word feminist has there's certain connotations that come with it, positive or negative. And uh, you could talk to a girl that says, "Oh, I hate feminism. I wouldn't be a feminist." And then you start talking to her about her ideas, and she is a feminist. You know, she she feels like women and men should be paid the same. Women should have the same rights. They should be able to vote. They should be able to, you know, do everything that a man should be able to do. She just doesn't want the title feminist because she feels that it has, you know, uh, that third wave feminist kind of. Well, I mean, it's just competing against your gender. You know, it's like it's it's that's so um, it. I mean, men do that, too. You know, like uh, I feel like. If if anybody – people are so tribal that if they don't explicitly put themselves in a category, you like you cannot try to put them in that. And it has nothing to do with like belief system. You right. Know, really. Right. Yeah. I don't know. You know. I, you know. I don't, I don't like – I don't like pe- when people call me conservative or uh, – uh, A fascist. Yeah. Or uh, <laughs> just, just straight up Hitler lover. None of that stuff, you know. But no, I'm well, just kidding. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's like it's one thing if it's like, you know, but conservative is a good point. It's like there's a whole like, you know, kind of like umbrella of beliefs that you get put in with the same kind of people that, you know, let's face it, aren't very popular right now. Right. But, you know, some people have that identity and they're really comfortable with it. Yeah. It's just I ain't it, nothing wrong with being comfortable with the identity or not being c- uncomfortable with the identity. You know, like <clears throat> I, I feel like uh you know, it, it, like I say, you go back to that that, that that hypothetical girl. If she doesn't want to call herself a feminist, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, like it's, tribalism. That's a really good point. I didn't mean to steal the thunder here. My bad. No, you're good. But uh, yeah, dude. Um, so what 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 would you say, if any, it was the difference between like how you looked at comedy like back when you started versus like now in terms of like perspectives yourself. Like crowds, other comics, and like the industry. Um, well, I'm definitely, I've definitely, definitely developed opinions about the industry, um, especially like the way that alt comedy works, like bar comedy, and the way that club comedy works. Right. You know, like I've done well in clubs, but it's definitely like an environment that is strange in a way. Yeah. Um. And. As far as like looking at other comics, I have like more ability now to say whether a guy's like funny or if he's like good, you know? Yeah. Uh, which I, you know, shouldn't say guy. So, you know, you like watch other comics 
and you you can at first be like, oh, this guy's really funny. He's really clever, right? But then later you're like, can we take a break for a second? Yeah. Okay, we're back. All right. Bryce is going to audit or edit all that nonsense out. But, uh, okay. Colton had a broken back. Yeah. There was a, there was a construction accident. With uh, oddly enough, one of uh, Donald Trump's uh, subsidiary construction companies, yeah, where a steel beam fell on his back, mm-hmm. and uh, now he's waiting to collect. Uh, Still haven't been paid for my work, right? Yeah, that is a weird thing. I, I would like to actually have solid, uh, like names of people that that happened to. Because I was talking to my dad about that, like, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of one of the, that's kind of the reason why he's he's really big is because like. Um, he would pay or he would hire like a smaller construction company to do like construction work in New York or whatever. And yeah. then, and then they wouldn't pay him, and then they would just beat him in court. Well, I mean, there's all those overseas accounts in Eastern Europe and the Middle East where he started product projects and had a company paid for the work. And then the project would be canceled after it was paid for. Right. And that happened quite frequently. I was listening to uh, Trump Inc. by Slate, which is kind of about the family's financial history before Trump was elected into office. Right. And one thing that it talks about is there's a lot of construction projects that were started in foreign countries where most business people don't uh, have, right, large hotel buildings. Right. And um, countries that are not friendly the u.s right and these projects would be ordered paid for partially and then canceled after two or three years ivanka trump ivanka was really involved with those the, especially uh, the ones in the near asia his his daughter yeah okay i mean she legitimately does help out with the way he runs his business right. i mean all of his kids are super involved which isn't really that surprising but i think ivanka really it's kind of like uh funny how much of it she seems to be involved in in some way yeah. all these the construction overseas and uh that's interesting it's not illegal yeah I, I i would definitely uh i'd definitely like to read about it and actually like see you know accounts and not just like hear rumors that mm-hmm. come from wherever and then well i mean if you're talking about somebody that was involved in new york real estate in the years that donald trump was you're talking about somebody that had some cd business ventures yeah. i don't i mean real estate is like an iconically dirty business. <laughs> yeah. That's like part of it, isn't well, it? He was active in like what the 60s, 70s, 80s, like the iconic, mm-hmm. you know, sleazy 80s businessman. That was, that was around the 90s 80. is when he stopped building his own projects and more just started selling his namesake to projects right. that wanted to increase what their planned revenue right. was. Right. At that point, his brand was more valuable than the buildings he was. He Absolutely. Was selling. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. That's, that's kind of the, uh, the goal for anybody that's a, you right. know, a marketing nerd. Right. But um, yeah, interesting stuff, man. Um, um, what we were talking about earlier was, you know, other comics and stuffs. Oh yeah, the industry. Yeah, I think I used to have this ability to watch a comic on stage and say, "Oh, that's funny," but I wouldn't be able to tell you why it was so good, and I wouldn't have been able to tell you if it was funny or if it was good. Because I remember a lot my early, early on. I would watch comics and think, wow, this guy's hilarious. And then I would watch them again, and I'd just be bored out of my mind. Right. And, uh, you know, especially new comics, that happens. Look, people come in, they have really, really good sets. And then they're kind of like drunk on power, and they don't have another set for like three months because they don't understand how to work with an audience. Right. But I really think that's kind of the defining line. Like, it's kind of easy to write funny jokes, you yeah. know? Like, it's pretty easy. And some of my jokes aren't even that clever, really. But I think people who know how organic an audience is, no. that's really, like, the understanding that you need to be, like, fun to watch, like, rewarding, right. you know? So, like, um, I, I grew up reading Spolin for improv. When I, I used to lead an improv workshop at my college. And I read a lot of Spolin, Viola Spolin at the time. Do you know who Viola Spolin is? I do not. So American improv, like the format of like, you know, Second City, you know, UCB, 
that format of improv was actually founded in like the 20s. It's really, really recently discovered, like, okay. you know, built. The person that built it was Viola Spolin, who was this tiny, tiny lesbian that lived in Chicago in, in the 20s. And what she started doing was she would go to community centers because there was large, really large influx of Chinese American and Italian American immigrants into Chicago at that time. Right. So what she would do is she would go to community centers and she would teach these classes that um, were based on the idea of like they were free to people who were, had immigrated to Chicago recently. Right. And the idea was let's get, all get together. And like, you know, what is improv? It's like, okay, you're a cashier and I'm buying an item and something goes haywire. How would you deal with that? Right. You know? And it's like, you can really, really see how instructive it is in her exercises that that's her goal yeah. is to not teach people how to be funny because improv doesn't have to be funny. Right. As long as it's um, genuine, as long as it's something you're actually reacting in a moment and feeding off of an energy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then it'll be rewarding for the audience, even if it's dramatic or slow or whatever. Right. You know, as long as it's, um, she says, uh, spontaneity is the key to creativity. Okay. So that's one thing I kind of believe in is like, I definitely have like rote jokes, like, you know, one liners, you know, every year on Thanksgiving, the American president pardons one turkey for its crimes against the Armenian people, right? <laughs> and it's like, I say that joke, the words are the exact same every single time. Yeah. But, no matter – even if it's the same – like if it's Wine Squared, which is a weekly gig. Right. It's the same 12 people every week. Right. You know? It's more people than that at Wine Squared. It's like 20. Yeah. Just to put that out there. But <laughs> – oh, The same 12 regulars for sure. Yeah. And then same, you... same cluster of people that watch it every week. Right. It's, you know, I've done that joke most weeks that I've run that, run that show because it's a good little moment. I, you know, I, it's easy to deliver. But – I still can't just say it the same way every time. Right. You know, there's like a, there's a pause or there's like a, you know, like every year on Thanksgiving, the American president pardons one turkey. And it's like, there's a pause there every single time. Right. Yeah. And if the audience knows where it's going, right, then it's more rewarding to just immediately dive into the next one, yeah. into the next line. Um, but if the audience is unfamiliar with the joke, it's really good to like, give it a second, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you can't even think about it that galaxy brain or whatever in the moment you really have to like develop a sense of what energy the audience it's like an acting partner you know it's like if you're in a scene let's say you're like um let's say you're like daniel day lewis right and you've been working on this some script for years like he does he'll retire for seven years and then turns out he was working on one movie the whole time yeah asshole Anyway, right. <laughs> he, he uh, you know, he'll like if he was in a scene, if he was like doing the milkshake scene yeah. from There Will Be Blood and somebody was in place of Paul Dano, who was like not really giving it back to Daniel Day Lewis, you know, like Paul Dano in that scene, he's like got his hands in his head and he like he's got this really dramatic face. His face is like physically red and he's like crying, begging right. him to stop. If, if Paul Dano was like playing that scene, like he was just sitting there and taking it. It would be less rewarding for Day Lewis to give the like way too large performance that he gives in that scene, but right. because Paul Dano is giving it back to him, yeah. you know, and really like they're feeding off each other's energy, they're reading each other yeah. organically, and you can see that when it's being filmed. That's like what's so rewarding about it. Right. Well, comedy is the same way. Like you can't go, just go up there and talk about your ex girlfriend for thirty minutes, right? And expect the audience to find it rewarding if you're not like. I mean, it's it's kind of like having sex. Like that's people say all the time. It's kind of hack, but it's like you're listening to someone else. You're like working with someone else, trying to like feel what energy they're giving back. And if you're not doing that, it's not going to be good, right? You know, if you're not like, <laughs> like you know, working with the the cues, the vocal cues, the laughs that the audience is giving you. Like if you go into a club and you've got like twelve people in the club, never seen your set before. And you start doing – I start doing jokes that are like – I'm using a lot of voices, right, or real loud. If I'm just like pretending the whole time that it's fucking going off, mm. right, unless I'm playing that bit as a line – like as a line in, so I'm playing that bit, it's going to be really, really strange for the audience to sit through. Right. Because they're not – I'm just reacting in space, acting in space. I'm not reacting. I'm just like – just going. Yeah. But like what I would do, right, is use the silence, Right. So if they're like is a small crowd and the material I want to do is a little bit louder, more voice based, yeah. So some of my material is, 
then I'm going to like use that silence and like use my own loudness to try to try to create dynamism that's the audience isn't going to give me because they're too small to laugh to like fill the room or they're, yeah. you know, or they're tired or, you know, especially at an open mic, like hour six in a, in a comedy club open mic where they've just watched 70 people go on stage. Yeah. You're not going to have them rolling yeah. unless you just like strike a nerve or something. Yeah. But it would be ridiculous of you to go in there expecting that to happen. So comics who can do that really like understand what space they're in and interact with it organically. Right. That's like what makes it rewarding or interesting to watch. Not yeah. if it's, you know, if it's really clever. You know, that's one thing that always kind of like bothers me when I watch comics who are real joke based and they'll do this thing where they'll like do a pun and then they'll be like, that's a double pun guys. Come on. I deserve credit for that. Right. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, but you didn't get <laughs> credit for it. You need to move on. Yeah. You know, I don't want to talk about your jokes. I want yeah. you to like continue to feed me information. Right. You know, figure out if you can figure out what about a joke is supposed to be funny to someone else. Yeah. Then that's how you can communicate with an audience in any space because right. you're able to say like it's not just that this pun about Donald Trump is funny. There's like something I believe personally that's making me like talk about him in this way. Right. And I if I can't communicate that emotionally to the audience, they're not going to give a shit. They're just going to think it's a dumb pun. Right. You know, even if it's a one-liner, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They uh yeah, you know, I ain't been doing it as long as you. I feel like, you know, if I were to add my my input and experiences in in that, uh, it would be, uh, you know, kind of pompous in in its own right. But you know, for what it's worth, I, uh, I've I've, I've experienced that. Like at your mic for sure. Uh, some of the best sets that I've ever had was like I'll just sit there and wait for people uh -huh. to start looking at me, and then like and start waiting on me to mm -hmm. start feeding them information, and then feed it to them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, you play with the silence. There's a handful of tools that you can do. You, yeah. you, you get your jokes. Those are the most obvious. The silence, uh, you know, body language or whatever, your facial expressions. Um, but like uh, like the last last week, I, I did a I did a I did a set at your mic, I think, and it was like uh, I just I just told a joke about like murdering somebody at work, and I was like, I need a new job. And uh, yeah, I know that joke. Yeah, somebody was like. Uh, uh, what do you do? And I was like, I'm a janitor at a school and the whole room just erupted. Yeah. Like just laughing. And I, I was like, I was like, that, that wasn't a joke. Well, that's like Spolin is, you know, that's exactly what Spolin would say is like the, because it was, you know, it was an honest reaction. Yeah. The honesty is what's rewarding for people. Right. Uh, Cause um, you realize you're not just dealing with a robot up there. Mm -hmm. You're, you're dealing with somebody that's actually like trying to yeah. communicate. One thing I always bring up when I talk about this, do you know who Dalton Pruitt is? Dude, I love his stand-up. I've, I've never spoken to him. I've seen him around. Yeah. He's a real, like, private person kind of, but yeah, he's really, really funny. Really, really talented writer. Really talented performer. And one thing I always say about Dalton said is, like, you know me. I don't like to push the line too much. I don't really think it's fun to, like, make people feel alienated. That's not something that I find fun in the space. Right. Right? I'm not, like, trying to get as randy or as awful as possible. Right. I have jokes that I do that in that I think are a little bit too far, but I, you know, the belief is that there's an overall point I'm trying to get to, and, like, as long as I can accommodate the audience in that space, then it'll be okay. Right. But Dalton, every single line out of his mouth when he's doing stand-up almost is filth, right? And it's, like, it's pretty funny or they're really offensive, and he, like, plays with, like, you know, like ironic racism a lot. Right. Which I don't, you know, like I said, that's not my style, but Dalton has a way about doing it where he's constantly reading the audience's energy that it can still be pretty rewarding because what what he is good at doing is if the audience is enjoying it and gets the game right, right then he can play a game with the audience where okay these are my this is my dark shit this is like the stuff that you're really going to have fun with right, right right but if the audience is not enjoying it Dalton's not going to change his material right but the way it, it it's clear kind of in the way he's performing that he, the game he's playing with the audience changes. Yeah. Right? Like in a small room or, you know, like uh, so Denton room, you know, college room or whatever. He's still going to be just as offensive. But it's clear that the game he's playing with the audience is inclusive of what their boundaries are. Right. It's tailored to the audience. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's more like a Dadaism kind of. It's right. like It's like Yoko Ono. It's like – it's almost like – he knows that for some people, those things are painful to listen to. Yeah. And it's opening up that wound and then trying to ice it back over with irony yeah. and like a human understanding that that's not appropriate. Right. 
but it's it's it just constantly pushes that envelope and reopens the wound over and over again. So it can be kind of emotionally rewarding because you're like <sighs> you're like laughing really hard, but it's also kind of like hard to listen to. I think you're like one of the only people that I've ever heard use Yoko Ono in a comparison to another artist in a positive way, and it worked. Yoko Ono is one of my favorite creative minds of the 20th century. Good, good job to you, and that's an interesting point, good sir. I just like ripping on her because she's a terrible person. She's she's really not that bad. Yeah, I just yeah, I know. It's, it's she's definitely the the. Uh, it's fun to hate this public feel. Yeah, you know, figure because she broke up the Beatles allegedly. <laughs> allegedly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was just John Lennon's ego was huge. Paul McCartney's, I mean, as they should be, they're three of the greatest songwriters of all time. Yeah, didn't John said. Lennon like like beat her up a few times. Yeah, John Lennon beat multiple wives. Yeah, yeah. Which uh, you know, people have known that for years. Yoko talked about it. They yeah. like forgave each other back and forth. Right, and it was a different world back then. Like, yeah, uh, you know, beating your wife <laughs> wasn't that uncommon in America. Yeah, right. It well, still really yeah. isn't all over the world, especially in England, because it was like they grew up in post World War Two. Yeah, the German. Well, Yoko Ono was kept in an internment camp by the American government. Oh, really? I didn't know. Yeah, that. yeah. She moved here from uh, Japan when she was six. When she was four, she was a classical piano player at a music college in Tokyo. Oh, really? One of the top music schools in the world. Japan is insane. They have this weird. I'm sorry. They they have this uh, this this method of teaching kids where they throw them into the deep end. And well, it's more make effective. Them swim right, and it is effective because they have kids. Uh, like you hop on YouTube and you go look up. You know, Japanese kid plays guitar. Yeah. And I've been playing for ten years, and this kid's six, and he's better than I am. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, but, it, you know, that's more effective. Like, it's if you're gonna learn how to play an instrument. Like, if you want to learn how to play violin, you have to start playing violin when you're, like, five years old. That's what I've heard. I've, I don't play violin, but that's what I've heard, read about violin, is that, especially people who play it, I have friends that do music. Right. And they say, yeah, I've been playing violin the whole lot, my whole life, and I didn't really understand it after, like, ten years of playing it. Because it's, there's no frets, there's nothing. And it's like, if you want to, le- like, make someone a great violin player, yeah. they have to pick it up at an early age. Because it's, like, as hard as learning a new language. Right, and it's like that's one of the you know big failures to me. I mean, there are a lot of failures of the American public school system, but one of the big ones is that we don't force languages on people. Like I took it in high school, and my brain, the amount of new information I was taking in socially at the time, I didn't really have space in my brain, right? To, in my like, in my RAM, you know, yeah, <laughs> to learn a new language at the time, right? Because I was learning all this math and shapes. But if you teach somebody a language when they're young, one, their brain, they they actually don't have as much of their like memory and sense of self put in yet. So right. teaching them another language, it's more like your first language. Yeah. And also it's easier because you're more like you have less to do than to learn a new language or learn how to play a violin because it's something that takes hours and hours and hours and hours of study. Right. To do well. Right. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, music, uh, it, that's kind of a cliche though. I mean, music is a, is a form of language like for sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's like math. It's, it's one of these universal languages where it doesn't matter. Like Beethoven didn't. I don't think he spoke English or whatever. But like yeah, his his music can speak to you if he wasn't put it he on. deaf. Yes. So did uh, they have sign language when Beethoven was alive? Uh, he was around in the, like the late eighteen hundreds, I believe, mid to late eighteen hundreds. Uh, I and, actually heard once that um, American sign language was the first sign language invented. I think I read that the other day. Okay, I, I, would, I don't think that's true. I would either buy that or say that that was probably the first popularized one. Yeah, because uh, I mean the Romans had had their own kind of forms of like uh, like flipping you off or whatever they had their yeah. own kind of thing. Well, uh, I mean it, you know, military salutes are a thing. Military signals with sign language. You know, yeah. they, they, it wouldn't surprise me if like you know that guy's definition of of an actual language like it means it includes all of this all these phrases and the alphabet and all this other whatnot yeah. but um yeah beethoven definitely definitely had his own methods of communication um and i'm i'm told that he was able to kind of figure out from the piano vibrations what stuff wanted to sound mm-hmm. like um which is crazy but po- definitely possible um yeah that's know. a that's pretty well known that like when you're when you have a sense that you don't have access to, your other ones are kind of like better. Dude, uh, you kind of looping back that that Dalton Pruitt kid. I've seen him go up on stage for five minutes and not say a damn thing. Yeah, and then just walk off. That's a whole thing. I mean, that's a whole like reacting to the audience in the space. Like, 
you know, if he realizes that they're like sitting there waiting on him, th- there's nothing more powerful than that. Yeah. So he's not afraid to use it the whole time. Jorge he, uh, Jorge Cortez yeah. did a similar thing. Yeah. Where he he uh, he he went up on stage and he looked at it and he's like I'm I'm too good I'm too good looking to tell jokes y'all I'm just too good looking to tell jokes and he said that in a different way every time that he would say it it was just it was it was different like he'd scream it at the top of his lungs he'd whisper it you know yeah he'd, he'd play with the pauses and he was he would kill kill one the thing, whole room. One thing I'm gonna miss about the Abbey Underground is the ability to go into that place at like midnight and have 15 minutes to do whatever the fuck I want. Right. I'm never going to, cause I had worked with him so much and I'd been such a regular, that open mic, especially like that. I mean, I had, it was the second open mic I ever went to. And the other one was Mabel's Mabel Peabody's, uh, beauty salon and chainsaw repair. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, are they still around? No, they're, they're closed. Yeah. You know where crossroads is the karaoke bar. Um, anyway, yeah, no. they're in the same place. Okay. Um, in Denton. They're in Denton. Yeah. It was over by, uh, the middle of nowhere over by TW. Okay. But, um, yeah, Abby was the second open mic I ever went to. And, um, I would go every week for years and years. They're about to close this month. I guess that's why I'm bringing this up. I'm but, making a documentary about it. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm going up there literally every night getting as many shots in as I can, interviewing as many people as I can as they're walking out, and then uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with it after the fact, but I'm going to just keep keep trying to film and, and talk to people that were involved in it and just try to capture the spirit of that place because you're right. The Abbey Underground was where I started comedy. That's yep. where I started seeing my – that's where I saw my first open mic. That's where I did my first open mic. Uh, that's where I had my first set that was actually good, like I killed it. Um, and you can just – just the energy of, the, of that place you go in there and it's just so warm and well it's like you know free yeah yeah there's no accepting you know, which isn't always great um because it's an open mic right and sometimes you get people on stage and uh no that's one thing i do that i feel like a lot of people get mad at me about but i'll light you early at an open mic if you're bombing yeah yeah or, yeah. or you know the uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Matt McElhone, Mana, and I, I think maybe Joey Johnson did this. Um, Mana for sure. <laughs> like, if you bomb at her open mic, she'll go up after you and do a set because she knows she can murder the crowd every yeah. time. <laughs> and, well, I mean, I definitely... <laughs> she's had to do that for me one time. She listens to this. I'm sure she won't. <laughs> Sorry, Mana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't mean to let you down. But There's all kinds of stuff you got to do sometimes. I, I, I run an open mic at... at, at uh, Bearded Monk sometimes, not every week, but Joey asked me to help out a lot because he's right. a busy, busy man, busy, yeah. busy man. And uh, one time there was a guy that went on stage there, and oh, my God, there were these two – there was this table of these folks who were trans and genderqueer, and this guy went up on stage and did like three minutes on how there were only two genders. No jokes. No jokes. And just like made full eye contact with his table. It was hateful. Dude. Like I get it. I get it if you don't understand being trans. But don't be a fucking asshole to somebody oh, in public. You I know wish what I'm I saying? could have been like a fly in that room just because like, you know, I'm a fan of history. I love reading about World War II. I love reading about Hitler. I, I don't agree with it. But I would have loved to have like kind of like seen just like the workings or whatever. Of it, like what it, wasn't, went down. it wasn't like fascinating or like dark or like. You know, um, compelling in any way. Right. It was just like it was just some asshole being an asshole to yeah. the people that were minding their own damn business. Yeah, you know, like he, if <laughs> if you know that what you're gonna say is gonna hurt someone, right? Unless you have like, I, I don't know. I don't. Maybe that's like a naive view of the world, but I just don't understand the idea that like it's fun to like make other people feel uncomfortable with who they are. Yeah, like, yeah, I can definitely get behind that, and and um. You know, uh, obviously I come from the right, but devil's advocate for the left. Uh, those from the, this scenario, those people were just eating tacos. Yeah, they weren't. They were sitting there. Yeah, being who they are. Uh, I mean, even the, if you don't think, even if <laughs> which I totally disagree with you, and I, I I I wish that I could talk to anybody that believes this, but like gender theory is really complex. I can't sit here and talk about it. But there is like gender theory that has been going on for years. Like we've been studying. Oh yeah, long, long before it ever became mainstream. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been trans people forever. Right. It is a real thing. Oh yeah, there's a there was a trans uh, uh, Roman soldier that they, uh, they they were talking about in the news the other day. Yeah. Like uh, it's it's not like some fucking Facebook weird thing. Right. It's like Facebook. I mean, we legalized gay marriage, so these people are more comfortable being in society. Right. There's nothing 
wrong with them. You know what I'm saying? They just feel more welcome to be themselves publicly. Right, right. It's like, you know, I don't know. Uh, and there's, and, you know, I'll play devil's advocate for the right. Um, I I can get behind not wanting to see, like, the, the, the more explicit portions of, like, the pride parade. Like, where there's, like, four-year-olds on the street. And well, the pride's like, not even gay anymore. As right. A, as a bisexual, I get to say that. Pride's not even gay. It's just, like, straight people who hang out with a lot of gay people. Right. That have, like, you know. Yeah, but uh, you know, show up every year. If you're looking, support. if you're looking at the, like the, the 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 Facebook memes or whatever, which are you know, it's, it's a trouble with media in general, mainstream or alt or whatever. Like you're only getting what that person wants you to see. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So when I when I see somebody reacting to a four year old, you know, like you know, a photograph of a four year old turning his back crying on a sidewalk while a half naked dude with nothing but a jock strap and an apparatus strapped to his junk is is like. You know, kind of. Is that like a Hallmark card or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Happy birthday, ma. <laughs> well, that's one thing I think okay. that we've just totally fucked up as a society. Right. Is like the uh, immediate sexualization of the human body. Right. It's something that, you know, we just. Uh, every human piece of human flesh that you see on yeah. TV or in the news, really. Right. You know, we're constantly talking about fucking each other and how, like, because like, it sells, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sells. It's compelling. Yeah. You know, like it's all nothing. it's all it's all out of appetite. It you're all like all that is 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 just appealing to the appetite rather than to the soul and to the mind. Yeah, but we also live in a you know fundamentalist country that uses it against us. Right. To turn us against each other. Right. Um Yeah. Yeah, I can kind of see that. Like I don't like I say, you know, <clears throat> I get along with pretty much anybody and I feel like uh I don't know where I was going with this. I kind of, I had like five thoughts that just popped up in my head, but that's a good point is this right versus left gay versus anti-gay pro-life versus pro-choice. Like it's, there's no room for a conversation anymore because it's more profitable to get people up in arms and at each other's throats. Well, it's, I mean, it's social media. People are so, I mean, it's like we were talking about earlier. People are so intrinsically tribal. Yeah. You know, like it, it's always been true that if, you know, that's why Hitler watching, you know, Nazi propaganda, Yeah. you know, there's an argument for like, so it's like, I don't know, there's an argument for occasionally exposing it to yourself to it once or twice just to see what it looks like. By the way, any political information you take in is propaganda. People don't realize oh, that, yeah. but propaganda is defined as any <laughs> media or anything that is meant to change or influence your political opinion. Right, exactly. I could so, I could tell you my political opinion right now, and that could be considered propaganda. Yeah, I feel like if you're talking about politics, yeah, uh, in a in any kind of persuasive way, yeah, that's propaganda. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's literally the definition. And there's like there's like propaganda that's you know not good and dark and immoral, and then there's propaganda that's like we really believe this, and we have to be able to like tell people what we believe. Right, you know? like not all propaganda is bad, but propaganda is bad as an idea. You know, we shouldn't do it to each other. People are so tribal, and it's like a lot of people. If it, I feel this happens to me so often, is like I'll be talking to someone, and they'll be like, you know, I'm very far left. I talk about being leftist on stage all the time. Right, I talk, I you know, I'm constantly speaking about, you know, and I try to like be well read and not sound like I'm just an idiot. I don't make fun of people for no reason. I don't like try to talk about and explain why I'm like mad at things. But I think a lot of times people hear me talk and if I don't agree with what they believe, it's over. It yeah. doesn't matter how much I articulate what I believe. If mm. if you feel like I'm not going to agree with you, your brain is going to find any way possible to distort what I'm saying right. into being wrong and bad. And the, the 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 weird thing is is like uh, that's kind of a delusion because there 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 is a uh, a time and place to disagree with somebody and then that disagreement becomes an enemy. Like yeah. I think it's okay, and this is this is an example, people. But like I think that uh, you know being a pedophile is uh, is okay because that guy can't do nothing about it. You know what I'm saying? That's definitely a hot topic that's kind of been thrown around out there. I had a cousin that was raped and murdered by some fucking guy when she was like 10 years old. Okay. So when I hear that sort of thing, <clears throat> that automatically, that automatically hits me. Now I'm not against finding, you know, a way to help somebody that, you know, recognizes that that's a, a problem. I'm all about that. But if, if, uh, you know, I hear like, you know, this 40 year old guy talking about how he likes 10 year old kids and you should be accepting of that. 
that that is a, like, an example of a disagreement. Well, it's like that I mean, I've been an enemy with them. You know I've what I'm been saying? like pinned down and like stopped in my action because I'm having like a manic episode. Like, right. I'm having like some kind of snap, or I'm like really heavily disassociated, and I'm kind of like losing. Like, uh, you know, I recently went to a restaurant. And I uh, spent a bunch of money. I actually used to work at the restaurant. Right. And I was just very disassociated. I wasn't really, like, in touch. I was kind of, like, having half a conversation with the bartender. And my bill came out, and it was, like, pretty expensive. I don't really remember why I did this. But I uh, I took it, and I put the $100 bill on my arm, and then I put the receipt on my arm, and I tried to staple it into my own arm oh. at the bar. Right. Cause that's a- and I got, like, one or two staples in, and then they were like, what are you doing? And I ripped it out threw it on the bar and ran out of the restaurant. Right. And it's like, if somebody <laughs> grabbed me and threw me on the ground so I didn't go kill myself after that, right. that would not be an unreasonable thing for them to do. Like, they would be attacking me, yeah. but that would not be an unreasonable thing. Yeah. If if pedophilia is a mental illness, which I don't know if it is, I don't think that it, it should be one because mental illnesses typically don't make people harmful. Right. You know, like, I'm not going to hurt someone else because I'm manic. Yeah. You know? I'm I'm going to, like hurt myself but that's because i have my own thing you know it's like it works within my sense of self to yeah. be a totally even though it's the same disorder so if pedophile pedophilia really is like a mental disorder then we need to make it in society where if you feel like you're gonna commit pedophilia yeah we're gonna help you there needs to be a place that you can go to yeah. so you don't do it right um, but if it's not a mental illness and it's like something else or some kind of distortion like i was molested yeah. And a lot of times people who commit those kind of crimes were molested. I would never, ever do that. Right. I have no impulse in me to do that. Right, but that's actually true. There's a lot of dudes that, like, most anybody that was molested or most anybody that is a molester was molested at one point in their right. life. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, and that's, like, a very human impulse to, like, um, reenact trauma. Right. You know? To try to go uh, process through it. I was it, in a relationship with a woman who had been abused by her mother. Not like that, but, like, verbally her entire life. Right, and it was so f- funny. Sometimes she would just be screaming at me till she was red in the face. Yeah, and it wasn't even really connected to what was happening, and I could feel that. And it wasn't really at me. It was just when people go through traumatic experiences like that, they yeah. have a tendency to like reenact it spontaneously. Uh, when you when you're dealing with somebody like that, do you ever kind of get the feeling that like uh, there's two versions of you in their head, and they're attacking the imaginary version instead of like attacking you? You know what I'm saying? You know, saying? I can't I can't say yes or no to that. I mean, I don't know what it is. All yeah. I know is that. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be directed at me. Right. It wasn't. It was just an anger, like this impulsive kind of like trying to escape out of a body, like you know, like your brain is chemicals telling you what to do, and her brain would be angry. No. Yeah. You know, and I've done that to people too. Like I have bipolar disorder. I was molested. Like I've definitely like lost my shit on people for no reason. Right. Right. I've definitely like been in relationships and said toxic things because I'm reenacting trauma that was placed on me. Right. If you don't take care of that, it's still on you. Right, responsibly. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Personal responsibility. It's like people are talking about all this sexual assault stuff right now. And, you know, there's this big there's this big push kind of to, like, people who have committed it and show no remorse need to be pushed out of society. Right. We need to, like, inst- instruct ourselves socially that it's not okay to be like this. Society has the right to defend itself just like the individual. Yeah. Now, I think <laughs> that a lot of people who commit sexual assault are doing exactly this. But it's the same thing I said earlier. If you feel like you are the type of person who could do that or you do do it, you need to have the maturity to fix yourself. Right. Or any, otherwise – Any means necessary short of you know, suicide. Because it doesn't matter what you're doing. If, it's, if you're doing it, you're responsible for it. Right. You know? But anyhow, kind of looping back to the original kind of tangent that put us here, I think that uh, – hey – you got to have the ability to go have a bar, a conversation at a bar with somebody, some stranger, and, and listen to this guy say, I think uh, Ron Paul was the best candidate for whatever. And you disagree with that? Be like, okay, all right, you yeah. can believe that, dumbass. That doesn't mean that you're a bad guy. Just, yeah, I mean, not even that. It's just. And I love Ron Paul. I kind of ripped on myself right there. Well, you know what I'm saying? You could replace him with Bernie or, or whatever. That's what we were. I mean, that's what I was talking about earlier. Everyone's a victim of propaganda. Right. You know, I my whole, my whole after, you know, because I spent right after Trump was elected, I spent a lot of time being angry at my friends and my dad. You know, my dad didn't even vote for Donald Trump, though. He wrote in for Trey Gowdy, which is like, what the fuck? <laughs> 
What the fuck? <laughs> dude, have you seen like Trey a... Gowdy on, on YouTube? Just him eviscerating just random dudes. Is... <laughs> he couldn't even go for the main guy. He had like right in like a like a sea bench fascist. Oh, uh, my dad. Uh, my... JV. Uh, well, uh, I don't think he's. he's, he's oh, uh, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, um, but uh, my dad, my dad wanted to go uh, for uh, Ben Carson during the primaries. Oh, yeah. Because he's real soft spoken. He's intelligent and uh, he? he's reasonable. <laughs> Uh, he's a he's a he's a he's an incredibly skilled neurosurgeon. Like, yeah. Uh, like not only is he a uh, high tier neurosurgeon, like in the circle of high tiers, like he's he's like really good at that point. Like, yeah, he I mean he's the pull... most famous neurosurgeon of all time, which is okay. great. But that doesn't mean that he's like well that smart. Is, yeah, or but, that he knows how society should work. It's like uh, Einstein said, if you uh, if you if you uh, you know, try to examine in a, uh, a fish on its ability to climb a tree. You're not really going to yeah. come up with good results. Or ben whatever. Carson is, I'm sure, a great brain scientist. Yeah. Uh, you know, surger, surge, surgerist, surgeon, <laughs> a great brain surgeon. But you know, if if <laughs> if he thinks that the minimum wage is going to be raised, I'm not going to fuck it for him. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, he uh, he he thinks that I don't remember what the thing was that kind of he has him some was, stuff. He like he's one of those big idea stuff. guys. Yeah. You know. He, yeah. He'll like. Which, I don't know. I posted on Twitter the other day asking someone to help me write some legislation. I got a really good idea. Okay. All right. What are we so, doing? So, you know, uh, all this gentrification is happening in coastal cities. Right. right. No more white people. Well, people come in. You know, if you improve a neighborhood. Right. Right. The big problem, really, is that cities don't want to build enough housing supply. Yeah. Because it would be bad for their economy. Okay. Like, if, 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 <laughs> if you – and now the feeling is it's like as soon as we improve an area – we're going to not only build new houses, but we're going to build less houses because we want those houses to be nice. Right. You know, and it's like the, there uh, is an example in Washington, D.C. of a building, a hotel that was being built. And it was originally planned to have 180 rooms or not a hotel, an apartment building that was being built. And they randomly decided to lower it down almost half and build condos instead because they're they're going to get more money because right. they can rent them at more than twice the amount. Right. That's just – like that's capitalism. Like people, if people have an incentive to make a profit, right. they will try to make a profit. Right. And you know, my idea is to go go into a city, right? Build like row houses for people who are truly low income. Right. Don't charge rent on them. How do you pay for that? Right. This is my idea. This is my big Ben Carson crazy ass idea. Okay. okay? Here we go. This is a crime. Matt McElhone said this to me. It's a crime under the Geneva Convention to use a treaded tank. In a scene of in a theater of war. Yeah. So we should just stop making those and take all that money and pay for houses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I often I often like kind of lose my mind on people when they say, "How are you going to pay for that?" It's what? like, well, have you seen the military budget? Dude, <laughs> like, we yeah. don't even have to cut the military. We just have to cut like if we stop making like one type of plane for a year. We could pay for almost all of this shit. So I was having a uh, uh, conversation with my uh, my buddy Nick Williams, who's on the podcast quite often, and uh, he was like. Uh, yeah, most of the stuff that goes in. Oh, it might have been mad, but like nuclear weapons, it's, it's in the energy bill. It's not yeah. under military funding. Yeah. Um, like VA taking care of the veterans, not in the military budget. Yeah. You know, which is, I mean, it's so funny. You know, because you know, respecting the military is one thing. You know, right. and not wanting to constantly deflate the military budget is one thing. Right. But I don't think people in mass kind of understand that that's very, very separated from taking care of our veterans. Right. You often hear people on the right. To, this is something I feel like I've heard a lot. Like, we should take care of our vets and yeah. people who live here before we take care of other people. It's like, yeah, we should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should. Yeah. I agree with you because we're not doing it. Yeah. And, you the, know, the other thing is uh, yeah, quasi-related. Um, <clears throat> we need to start talking about, like – Fixing whatever the hell is wrong with Mexico that's making people want to immigrate to this country in mass. Well, I mean, like the corruption for one, but like just the dude, they got a, they had a drug war down there just like we did, and it just ruined them. You know, I mean, it's because of our war on drugs that it right. got so bad. Exactly, we need to fix that here, and then we need to get rid of the central bank that owns our money supply and s switch it back over. To, I mean. Uh, just to kind of stick on this, I think if we legalized every drug, I think like really far leftists and re like really far right libertarians yeah. will agree on this. Yeah. We should legalize yeah. every drug and treat people when they get addicted to I it. I ought to be able to – yeah, exactly. I ought to be able to cook meth in my bathroom. And that, this is not a joke. I know everything that I say is a joke. But I ought to be able to cook meth in my bathroom 
completely unmolested by the law. Well, it, it, if you want to cook meth in your bathroom, in my house or whatever. But what you need to understand is that you're going to like destroy yourself. Like you're going to kill yourself. Right. But if we legalized it and people needed like meth, you can just give them Adderall if right. it's like legal to just use it. We can just like say like you don't have to harm yourself trying to cook like meth. The, the, like, yeah. The trouble with the drug war is that when you have a law that allows the government to outlaw a particular substance, it then militarizes the police and makes the citizen the target of the government. I th- really, is, I think the militarization of police in response to the drug war is like a huge civil rights issue. Yeah, that, that people don't talk about. Yeah, and and and, and pe- uh, police departments do not need SWAT vehicles. Like. You need one – if you're going to – if you're a state, right, You every police department does not need, like, an armored truck. Right. I'm sorry. Like, that's ridiculous to say. Yeah. You know, I don't even know that in major cities all police should be armed with well, a gun. It freaks it freaks me out, and I'll tell you something else, uh, and I, I don't know where you stand on this, but, like, <clears throat> I, I'm – Firm, a firm believer of the Second Amendment because I know that the nature of, you know, governments – are to just willy nilly. Let's arm the police department, every police department in the country, with an arsenal that no one in their right mind can defend against. Like, I guess, like theoretically, I agree with you, but I think if you're talking about like America, yeah, uh, it's lost. Like, <laughs> well, we've allowed them to militarize so heavily. It yeah. doesn't matter how many AK-47s you have in your house. I, you're, if the government wants to like take them away. You're either going to die or they're going to take your guns away. Well, actually, uh, um, from a from a strategy and tactical standpoint, I will disagree, and I've, uh, and that's because I've had several conversations with a lot of guys that knew a lot more about this stuff than I do, and I'm probably talking out of my ass here, but um, it is almost impossible to in- invade uh, 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 like a neighborhood, say, when every person in that neighborhood is armed. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah, but every uh, person's not armed. Yeah, but and the people that have, armed. I mean, the well, U.S. We, military is the largest, like, the most scary thing right. that s- humanity has created. Right. Like, the U.S. military dominance is the most impressive thing that human humanity, objectively, like, good or bad, right. has ever pulled off. Right. Really. The collective power of that. I just don't understand, like, if they want, <laughs> if the government is so corrupt that they're, like, fighting against us, we lost. Yeah, uh, and that was what, kind of what Thomas Jefferson said. Um, yeah, that's what he said about the Second Amendment. He's like, the only reason why we have the Second Amendment there is because if uh, if it ever goes away, that's when you need it. But and, and it's hard to defend against a drone strike, and I'm sure there's a thousand other you know arguments for that. Uh, the 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 one the one counter that I've heard to to that kind of um, you know that's a common argument is that American military is so strong that it doesn't matter if you have AK-47s or whatever, you're not going to win. Um, from 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 what I kind of gathered was. It, it it having a, an entire neighborhood that's being invaded, everybody's armed. It neutralizes the uh, it neutralizes that threat because th- they can't get in there without destroying literally everything, and that's not what they want to do. So it becomes more costly to them to just yeah. like drone strike the hell out of that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But uh, again, I, I would very much like to. <clears throat> clearly, I'm not articulating myself because I'm I'm, I'm pulling from uh, yeah. what have you, but. The, uh, one of my biggest fears is, is just watching like all these you know videos of, of like police going around shooting random black kids for like no reason. <clears throat> when the Second Amendment goes away, that's not just going to be random black kids. That's going to be everybody, and it's going to be oh, you stepped off the sidewalk. Why don't you sit down? And as a man, I don't I don't mind talking back to police. You know what I'm saying? Well, like, I mean, yeah. Um, but I've I mean, seen videos where you're not going to get like I've talked back to police officers. I've yeah, but made I've, sarcastic comments. They're not going to fuck with you. Yeah, I've seen I've seen videos where people just get summarily executed for talking back to people. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> there's a huge issue with just like the culture that police departments are founded on. Right. I don't think a lot of people are just you know. Well, the the culture of police of. departments has been perverted since like the. Uh, well, I mean, that's not really even accurate because when the police departments in America were founded, they were made to catch slaves and bring them back to their. Ah, uh, okay, all right, it's, okay, I'll give you that. But uh, there is a huge difference between uh, police departments in like the '80s versus police departments now. Yeah, like I know a lot of good old boys that that uh, they quit. Like my buddy, uh, his dad was a World War II veteran. He was a cop in um, Milwaukee for, or yeah, Muskegon rather for uh, like 20 years, and he he got out because they were forcing him to. Uh, 
uh, do stupid crap like like put a radar gun in his in his car. He hated that. Yeah, like he was. What are you doing, making me pull somebody over for going twenty miles over the speed limit on the freeway? Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, you know, uh, in, um, in major cities, the police departments, especially in the eighties, were awful about that. Like that's when that's at the height of like police departments quickly, quickly, you know, militarizing to fight the war on drugs. You know, because you got Nixon in the seventies and uh, Rudy Giuliani was mayor of new york in the 90s and his stop and frisk policy is one of the most tragic things that has ever happened to yeah. a neighborhood yeah, and the, the amount yeah. of like public trust that caused to just dissipate Did, is truly heartbreaking i don't understand how immediately they didn't get shut down with the, no there's a fourth amendment you're a, a city guy yeah. you, this is a federal government you cannot do that well it's because you know i i just think the whole idea that like this the weird you know there's like a there's conservatism and then there's like the American right and uh, neo neo conservatives. It's very different, you yeah. know. It's like the the issue of race. I think it was. Uh, oh, Dara Lynn from Vox. Okay. She had a quote recently um, in a, in a podcast I was listening to, and uh, what she said was, "Oh my gosh, I can't remember it." Oh, what did you just say? Something about race. Oh. She has this whole theory. She kind of explained it in an essay that conservatism didn't like solve race, especially like in the Nixon and Reagan eras. They just right. kind of like ignored race. Yeah, they swept it on the rug. And the religious right like solved it for them. And then everybody, you know, like they they were married together. So it's like if you're a conservative, like a you know, like a really far right libertarian, you know, like you're probably not as likely to have like racially kind of like warped views right right especially on things like stop and frisk right but if you're like uh you know a fundamentalist republican you're probably more likely to have like kind of warped views on how militarized police departments should be you yeah. know and the 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 90s democratic party was also a big you know push for that like the clinton's crime bill is just such a tragedy yeah and um it's just something that like i think people for a long time have seen how the war on drugs how the, you know that has been used on black citizens. Right. And kind of like, you know, silently known it was happening or maybe didn't believe that it was happening. Right. And then you know, social media comes in. We start seeing all these videos of people being killed. There was that kid that was like 16 and 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 white, and he was selling Coke. He got busted trying to sell Coke to this police officer. Right. And he pulled out. Guy shot him three times in the chest. 16-year-old kid selling yeah. Coke. Yeah. And it's like, I get that Coke is illegal, but it's not a death sentence. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think that like... Like, there are multiple countries in the world that take care of their crime without having guns on them and Dude, the ability to execute people in the street. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what to tell you about the, the cops having the guns um, as a can of worms that I, I don't want to get into. I, I, I don't feel comfortable around a, an armed police officer unless I'm armed, for sure. But um, I, I will say that there's a lot of countries out there that are just knocking it out of the park with the way that they deal with addiction. Uh-huh. The, like especially in Europe, yeah, yeah, and I hate uh, uh, hearing that come out of my mouth because Europe is just the, well. Hey, Denmark is one of the top rated heritage foundation countries. I don't know what heritage foundation is. It's the conservative foundation that. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. They, they were uh, one of the main donors to. But uh, yeah. it's a super PAC. Um, they the okay the the uh, the way they they deal with it out there. Like if you're on heroin and you're trying to get off heroin, you go into the clinic. They give you, um, you know, ten doses. And they will treat you, you like you're having there, a medical problem. Right. They, you come back in there the next week and they give you nine doses and they just yeah. wean your ass off of that until you're done with heroin. Yeah. You know? And you'll probably relapse, but they'll just take care of you again. Yeah. And they'll, like, the idea that the, I mean, this is something we probably totally disagree on, but the idea that the government's main responsibility is not to help us with our health and keep us, like, alive and healthy as a populace just yeah. drives me crazy. Well, I certainly don't think that the government should have its hand in actively making the citizen population's uh, daily lives worse, which is exactly what the drug war is doing. Yeah. This is 100% what, it, what it's been doing because it has it increased demand like through the roof, mm -hmm. and it's like this, this cycle where, okay, we're going to supply the drugs. The CIA has been caught so many times filtering drugs in here. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. So the government gives us the drugs. We use it. They bust us for using the drugs. They put us in, a, in their prison systems for draconian amounts. <laughs> of time where you're their slave. And then yeah. when you get back out, you get busted again because your entire life is wrecked because the laws in this country don't allow felons to succeed. And or then, vote. yeah. And then, um, 
and and then you know repeat rinse wash repeat you know yeah. what I'm, like over and over and over no it's i mean it's a huge problem and it's all like the thing that is maybe the, the most frustrating thing to try to like communicate to people is that it's all intentional yeah it's all intentional yeah the 13th amendment which freed the slaves quote unquote wrote in that the only way you could be a slave in america is if you were arrested for a crime right that's well, in the amendment well and and um the i have no trouble with the wording of that but it's the subtext that i have the trouble with is what is a crime you know what i'm saying I, literally and it anything. used to be in this in this country that a, a, a felony had a very specific uh a very specific meaning it was you damaged someone or you damaged their property mm-hmm. nowadays a felony is you know i accidentally opened up the wrong mailbox cuz they're right next to each other or um uh, you know, that's probably a poor example because you're still, you know, mail tampering. That's a, that's kind of falling under property. But like, um, or like I bought cocaine to do by myself. Yeah, that 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 hurts no one but yourself. No, nope. um, outside of uh, you know, if we're looking at this, you know, and we're having an honest conversation. Personal responsibility is is uh, Acknowledging that you don't live in a vacuum and that your your decisions have consequences to other people, but in terms of harming other people uh, physically or their property, you doing cocaine in the bathroom isn't gonna isn't gonna hurt anyone. So it's not a felony. Yeah, it's 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 nonsensical. And uh, there you know there's this, there's this quote is uh it's a police state is not defined by what the government does to its citizens. It's what it's allowed to do to its citizens. Yeah. what it has the potential to do. We're definitely in a police state because of this this drug war nonsense. Yeah. Um. Which is something that is nonpartisan. It's it's so partisan. Yeah, that's what people you know don't realize. That's why I'm kind of excited about what's happening to the Democratic Party because I feel like see the, I kind of unplugged. What's happening? I unplugged after the election. I well, actually I mean, it's unplugged from the Democratic left. Party after they they screwed Bernie over. I don't even like Bernie, but like did I, you read Elizabeth Warren's new bill? Uh, uh-uh. it's really good. Okay, it's called the uh, Accountable Capitalism Act. Okay. So her I Elizabeth Warren whole thing is that she's not a socialist. She says to my core, I'm a capitalist. Right. I believe in capitalism, but you know, she wants to fix it is all her right. whole thing. The bill, um, forty percent of all board members on executive boards are elected by employees of the company. That's a new rule. And uh it also changes some uh laws as far as like where you're saying your company is located. Like what it's you, harder to say you're in Delaware what do when you you're th- not think about corporate personhood like oh it's <laughs> fucking tragedy man yeah yeah hobby lobby should not be able to discriminate against its employees by not giving them birth control because of their personal beliefs the owner's beliefs i think that uh we should go back to the old i say this all the time we should go back to the old system of corporations where every four years that corporation has to go and renew their charter, and it's the exact opposite as a citizen. It, with a citizen that's, that's on trial, it's innocent until proven guilty. With a corporation, that thing should have to justify its existence. And if the, the committee that, that is going to renew the charter decides that, that corporation cannot exist anymore because they're doing too much damage, it goes away. But, I just don't, I don't see how that's going to happen. Yeah, I don't see how it's going to happen either. But, I mean, like I said, you know, we were kind of – playing with the idea of colonizing mars but if there's ever a, a new society somewhere that with a new a new country or new yeah. government then that has got to be in the well Constitution. the other thing that's happening you has know, to be one of the reasons i think that's bills is a really good idea to give employees more power over what the company's doing and how it's you know who's who's uh because the reagan belief is that if you empower shareholders right it'll trickle down which i don't believe that that has ever been proven to work it's it's but it was supposed to rise in equality they Reagan admitted that that would maybe happen, but the idea was that it would create so much growth, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Right. It hasn't worked. Yeah. Growth is slowing. Growth is slowing, and inequality is, like, nuts right yeah. now. The, the, the inequality in the American economic system is, I mean, fucking Alabama was, I think it was Snopes that said, Alab- like, living in Alabama is basically equivalent to living in, like, a third world country. Yeah. Which is problematic term but well yeah uh i don't think it's problematic if you're using it in a in the right context which yeah. is just that, i mean that's any general. that's any term though no. right um well you know maybe there's a couple that yeah, probably I just shouldn't you fuck and with. i both went to that exact term yeah. that we're thinking yeah i always tell people people always ask me like my opinion 
on using like offensive language on stage or like racial slurs. Right. And I just always say like, if I'm not black, I can't tell you when you shouldn't say the N word. Cause I don't, I, it doesn't fucking apply to me, man. Like, I don't know. I think you're never supposed to say it, but I've also seen like people <laughs> drop it in front of black people and nobody says anything. Yeah. So I'm not really, it's, I, you know, the whole thing, my whole thing on race and especially like we were talking about feminism earlier. Right. It's like, it's not my call anymore. Like I know what I'm going to do, right. but I can't. Well, it's just, you, you can't. If it's, if it's you and me one-on-one -on -one and you were to drop it, I'd be like, why? You know? Why? Why? Because it, it's stupid. It's like, it doesn't add anything. There's no relevance to it. It's just, it's just boring and it's awful to hear. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a comic, uh, DDT, uh, who works in, uh, New Orleans now. She used to work up here. Okay. And one time we were talking about it. Uh, there was a comic who was white that dropped it on stage and right. she got pissed. And she was constantly subversive, really subversive. So I kind of just, you know, I, I don't think I asked her about it. I think we were in a group of people and somebody else asked her about it. And yeah. she said, it's not really offensive when a white person says the N-word. Yeah. It's the smug fucking look on their face when they say it in front of me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like yeah. this attitude that you're like getting away with something. Yeah. Or playing with. It's like, yeah, it's like discrimination, story discrimination that has like ruined multiple generations. Yeah. You know? And it's yeah. like that. that is connected, you know, the drug war. The 13th Amendment still being about slavery. All of that is connected to the usage of that word. Yeah. There's just nothing, like, relieving about it. You're not, like, you know, it's kind of hard to say this, but it's like, you're probably not going to say anything important if that's your angle. <laughs> yeah, uh, unless you're using it in reference to itself and talking, you're making an argument that no right. word should have special power. Or, you know what I mean? But, Why not? Um, I mean, there's a reason that we have, did you know that there's a different part of the brain that's accessed when we swear? Like when Yeah. You, yeah, it, it drops dopamine in your brain. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's the same part that, like, you know, controls. That's like, an argument that we stuff. shouldn't say certain words. Right, exactly. A a or at least, like, make sure that the, the context is right. uh, appropriate. Well, that's what people always say is, like, you got to watch the context, you got to watch the context. And it's like, I will watch the context, yeah, you know? Yeah, that one in But I'm telling you, like, in general. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, and that one in particular, there's, there's just not... I'm sure I could sit here for 10 minutes thinking and I could come up with, like, a, a reason to, like... To use it, especially in, in present company, because yeah. obviously it makes you uncomfortable to, to hear or say the word or whatever. But like, if somebody with class won't drop a swear, it's like cussing in church. You don't cuss in church. You don't say the n word in front of uh, in front of somebody that makes it uncomfortable to. You know what I'm saying? There's there's yeah. a class thing there. Yeah. Um, but that's interesting. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't really like to talk about that. Yeah, um, me either. I that and uh, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I just flat out just I don't like white people. I'm so tired of like liberals, Sorry. like white liberals on the internet complaining about other white people. It's like there's no way that you have any social context to be angry about that. Yeah, it's entirely. Like it is what yo have you seen? Have you seen the uh, the the I'm so sorry guys where they they wear the black shirts that say I'm sorry and they get themselves chained up like they're yeah. slaves being sold from the that's like, a bit ridiculous yeah I mean it's that's kind of, like the Westboro Baptist Church of the left like those well, people are so f it's provocative and we're talking about it right and <laughs> and it's provocative we're talking about it and like. I don't know, man. I don't really care about that. You know, if if the government had paid reparations to black people, I would find that a little bit more ridiculous. But because of the fact that we've never really tried to, like, make up for the multiple genocides we committed in our early history. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um. I mean. There's been no effort by the government whatsoever to apologize for the genocide. Like, we still say, like, the past. Bill Clinton said that there should be a portrait of Andrew Jackson. In the White House. Did he really? George Bush said that he liked Andrew Jackson. And Donald Trump has said that Andrew Jackson is his favorite president. Well, I and that guy is believe that. directly I, responsible for mass genocide. Uh, he See, Jefferson hated the idea of Andrew Jackson becoming president before it happened when he was still, uh, when he was still like, uh, a congressman. But uh, that guy – it's like Genghis Khan. Okay, so Dan Carlin has this thing in his Hardcore History podcast where he's like talking about great men and a lot of people like uh, they'll – he likens it to like firing a, an arrow and then wherever it hits, you paint the target around it. Um, and he was like likening that to Genghis Khan. Cause he did all these great things. Like he opened up the silk roads and, and whatever, but that was kind of, that was kind of um, not really what he was going for. He wanted to conquer the world, you know? Yeah. And with Jackson, it's, it's kind of the reverse. The guy really did like care about the Americans 
in his own right. And he, he like he to his credit, he got rid of the the central bank at the time, which he smashed it into a thousand pieces. And it it, it, it took him seventy years to kind of reestablish their stranglehold on the the money supply here in this country. But my God, like everything else that he did was like, dude. It, these people helped you. They're the only reason why you you were able to fight off the British. Was Gleefully because, committed suicide, genocide. Yeah, and, and wrote about how fun it was and why he was doing it. I didn't like know. That, I didn't know he wrote about it. Yeah, he wrote about it off. and celebrated it. Yeah, but that, I mean, again, and I'm not. Uh, uh, I won't even play devil's advocate here. I'll just kind of make a note: is that uh, that guy was was subjected from a very early kind of a note on trauma. That guy was subjected from a very early age to the brutality of the British army. At that time, uh, he had a scar from when he was 13. Um, he was a prisoner, a prisoner of war in the Revolutionary War uh, from uh, when there was there was an English officer that said, shine my boots, boy. And he said, no, I'm a prisoner of war and you're going to treat me like a prisoner of war with respect. And the guy took his sword and he was going to cut his head off and he just hit him in the eye. Um, then he watched his both his mother and his brother like die horribly of like uh, like like. Um, some war related disease his mother like uh marched like 70 miles on foot to carry him like back to home or whatever because he was sick and she nursed him to health and she died right after the same disease he had like he had a really you know troubled kind of thing going up but i don't know where i was going i was just spouting off a bunch of fun facts but you know like we were saying earlier like most people that in you know were you know child molesters they were molested themselves Jackson was exposed to that kind of brutality. This is no, it's no surprise that, you know, he would yeah. carry that out. Not saying that he was good or bad for, well, yeah, definitely bad for it, obviously. But yeah, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's what we keep saying. It's like, even if it's, there's some trauma that you're reenacting that it's like, you know, you're still responsible for your ideas yeah, for sure. Well, a hundred percent. And it, you know, I, I get the whole national bank thing. I suppose it's not really like a, you know, I kind of like am in favor of nationalization overall. Okay. More than I think, you know, just because I think that the government's job is to like manage the economy and make sure that it doesn't fucking starve us out. Oh yeah, I'm right there with you. It's just that my the government doesn't control the money. It's 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 just a, a group of private bankers that loan money to the we government. Have a profit motive. Right. And then like that's the great <laughs> that's the great flaw of America is that there's all these beautiful ideas behind it, except for, you know, the genocidal stuff. Right. But uh, we gave everything a profit motive. And if you give someone a profit motive, that's all they're going to yeah. pay attention to. So, like, I mean, I, I'm definitely – that's kind of why I was intrigued by your Elizabeth Warren bill is, like, I'm all in favor of, of capitalism being uh, rigged so that the people can, can – uh, Well, it's like small it. businesses. You know, like small businesses are, you know, at this point, they would be bad for the economy. Right. If we're talking about like actual GDP and growth, right? You know, it's like small businesses where there's like a different small business in every town. That wouldn't be good for the national GDP. That would yeah. make the government less money. But there's like a moral argument that like it's better for society. Like it's more healthy for us to live like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's like is the government's job to make sure that we have the best environment for ourselves mentally, which that, that's what I believe, or is the government's job to like create the biggest economy in the world so it can pay for this overpowered military? Or is there a, is there a medium, a happy medium? That we can kind of accomplish there, I wonder. But Maybe. I mean, we'll see, man. Tec- Technology is crazy because we definitely have a lot of problems we don't have any answers for. And if we come up with some like crazy Star Trek, I can have this solar powered thing that just phases matter from energy, and uh, now it's a you know a hot meal. Right. That's gonna, you know. Well, it feels like we're so many years away from AI, but I think it was you know. Uh, Elon Musk freaks out about that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, we're, we're summoning the demon. We're creating a killer robot race. They're going to kill yeah. us all. <laughs> I think, uh, I think you know, it's like we're kind of like afraid of AI, but I, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Matt Iglesias made this point um, on Twitter that as soon as like uh, an AI is capable of performing, outperforming like one truck driver. Yeah. It's capable of performing every truck driver within a year. Yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. no more. And it'll all be automated. And the, yeah. the truck driving industry will go away. Yeah. Same thing with, uh, uh, you know, like accounting no, that was, or whatever. That was Andrew McNabb, actually, who oh. is running for president on the Democratic ticket oh, in really? 2020. Yeah. Yeah. He, he uh, runs the uh, – oh, what is it? Um, some organization – he runs something, and that's important. It's not the Heritage Foundation. That's something we talked about earlier. 
Give me one second. Okay. Well, I will uh, take this opportunity to say that we have been going for an hour and 43 minutes, and we skipped for a little bit there, so it's probably a little bit off. But uh, we do have an AMA, and uh, I have an AMA a question for you. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to blow through this thing real quick. But, uh, I wanted to ask, what is your approach on— Venture for America. Okay. All right. I'll buy that. We're going into the AMA. Okay. Um, the, the first question I'm going to take, because I, I wanted to ask you this. What is your approach on dealing with hecklers? Uh, just try to make them feel, you know, you want them to stop taking up your space, but you also don't want them to feel excluded because then you'll lose the whole audience. Okay. You know, so play, find out what game they're trying to play and then win it. Okay. Okay. You know? I've seen, uh, uh, I've seen a couple of different approaches. I've seen, uh, uh, the, the first night I actually hung out with Mana. Uh, we went over to that Twilight Lounge bar after after hers, or not Twilight Lounge. We went over to Lola's uh-huh. in Fort Worth, and uh, there was a there was a guy in the crowd that just would not shut up, and so she started ripping on him. Like she she had a bit about I don't know beer or something like that. He's like, yeah, I want to go get a six pack. Oh, you wish you had a six pack, you old fuck. Why don't you shut the hell? Like just eviscerated this guy yeah. to the point where he got embarrassed, cussed her out, and walked out. Like, yeah, I thought that was. And it made the show better because the dude shut up, and now I can, you know. Yeah. I got assaulted once at Dusty's. Oh, really? Yeah. That's awesome. This guy, uh, there was this woman, and um, they were, like, hanging out or whatever, watching the show at, at Dusty's. And uh, he, he went to the bathroom, and his wife was sitting at the bar. And uh, sometimes I forget that uh, I don't quite present, like, my Matrix brain, you know, like. So this lady, she said something, and I was like, uh, oh, so I made a joke about Trump, and it didn't get a big response. I didn't get a good laugh. It, like two people chuckled, two pity laughs. And she goes, well, you got one laugh, real loud. And I was like, actually, it was two, bitch. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Which, like, if you knew me, you would know that, like, I say bitch all the time. Right. Or, uh, and I, it's very, like, That's one of those subversive. ginger fluid terms. Yeah, it's something that, you know, <laughs> my, my friends get to use it casually. A lot of people I hang out with get to use it casually. Yeah. So it's like, it's something that I can say, you know? Yeah. And they're not going to think it's like super personal. Right. But you forgot. And actually, it, there was a recording on my Facebook of this happening because I didn't want people to think that I was like calling someone a bitch because it's very out of character for me. Right, right. And I posted the full recording. Anyway, I said, uh, actually, that's too bitch. And then I was like, um, hey, uh, I'm, it came out weird. And I was like, hey, I know that was kind of like really forceful and mean. I don't really think you're a bitch. I'm just trying to like have some fun. Yeah. And she was like, well, you better hope I don't tell my husband when he gets out of the bathroom because he's going to kick your ass. Oh. And at that point, I was like, well, if you're just going to, you know, argue in bad faith, I'm not going to like, you know, I always say this. Don't give people the benefit of the doubt when they're acting in bad faith. Right. So I just dropped to the floor with the mic in my hand. And I started being like, oh, no, I hope he doesn't hurt me. And I was like, I say it all the time. It's really not personal at all. I'm just laying down on the floor. And I do a couple more Donald Trump jokes. And then he walks out, and I'm laying down on the floor. He walks up to his wife, and he goes, what's he doing? Yeah. She goes, he called me a bitch. So I'm laying on the floor, and this guy walks over and, like, kicks me in the fucking head. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, kicks me in the fucking, like, almost in the face. He got my shoulder and my neck. That's bit. insane. Yeah, he was pissed, and he was trying to, like, fucking fight me. Yeah. Well, a couple weeks later, I found out that guy's there all the time. He's, like, a regular. He got banned for 45 days from that bar. Good. Yeah, for doing that. But... What the the bartender told me, because he was, like, there, and yeah. he was not on my side. He, I, he knew that guy well. Oh, you know? really? So the bartender goes, well, you know, you might be careful about coming back, because he normally carries a strap on him. I don't know why I wasn't armed that night. Yeah. And I was like, I could have fucking died. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, and then that guy's a psychopath. Because that guy clearly. In a, in, a, in a bar, period. That guy clearly has a fucking problem. Yeah. Something. So did that bartender. Fuck that guy. Yeah. It was that was very disturbing. When yeah. I was that dude me. needed his ass beat right there in front of God. Well, and I'm not gonna do it. You know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be careful, man. That's definitely a good a good kind of lesson to kind of pull away from that. Is because when you're a comic, well, I don't even know what I'm hecklers. supposed to do. I apologized. I've never seen a comic apologize for saying something to an audience member. Yeah. Be like, oh, that was mean. Yeah. I literally apologized like multiple times, and I apologized to him too when he was kicking me in the head. I was like, dude, I was fucking kidding. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And he's like, fuck you, fuck you. You call my wife a fucking bitch. Yeah. Well, she was. So maybe get yeah, your bitch under control. Yeah. Seems like you're kind of a douchebag too. Yeah. Very really rude. Jackass. Very rude. Yeah. It's very rude to kick people in the head. 
kicking people in the head is fucked up, man. All right. So we'll dive into this AMA. Thanks for that, dude. That was awesome. That was a great story. Uh, Micah J. Brown asks, are some of those that work forces the same that burn crosses? We talked about this earlier. Did we? Police were founded as slave catchers, bro. Oh. Well, yeah. Now White we know. supremacy and police departments are intrinsically linked. You can't oh. convince me that's not true. Okay. So um, you heard it. You heard it here, Micah. Uh, yes. Yes. Answer is yes. <laughs> uh, why no more mutton chops from Micah Brown? Oh, uh, you know, you know who likes uh, mutton chops? Um, Straight men. That's it. That's the whole. <laughs> that's all of them. Yeah, yeah. I'll buy that. <laughs> yeah. Or or girls that are like they think uh, Hugh Jackman's like hot. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Well, I'm like mutton chops I'm not like that m- whole series, man. Mut- I'm not manly enough per se to like fulfill the person who's like into the guy with mutton chops, right? right? Like, once they start hanging out with me and, like, we're alone and I'm, like, wearing their basketball shorts and, like, dancing to Beyonce in front of them. Yeah. Like, the mutton chops, they've lost their power. Yeah, man. Yeah. There's no, you know. Shave them. At that point, you just got to shave. Either that or start working out. I just went back to the beard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I need to shave mine. I I, I, I grew it because I was fat and now I'm trying to lose weight, so I'm kind of using that as incentive (laughs) to just lose more weight. Because every time I look in the mirror and I see the... It's it's bad when you, like, have a... You when you, especially when I shave, especially yeah. if you like, I used to struggle with body dysmorphia when I was in college. I, I had bulimia. Is. Bulimia. I, yeah. Yeah. I know what that is. Yeah. I had bulimia. Uh, actually also thought I was, it was a whole thing. Um, <laughs> but this does not surprise me that you had several things <laughs> yeah. in, the, in yeah. various places, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was struggling with bulimia and, uh, I remember it's just an awful feeling to like look at yourself and just feel fatter than you are. Right. You know? Yeah. Or like I, I used to get in, in arguments with my girlfriend cause I'd be like, the shirt look all right. And she'd yeah. be like, yeah, it looks good. You look good. You look handsome. And I'd be like, oh, why are you fucking lying to me? Like, I know this doesn't fit. It's too small. Ugh. You know, not like that aggressive right. every time I say I curse all the time. I'm not like. Right, right, right. We established that with a bitch story. Yeah, yeah. Bitch story, yeah. About, I Sometimes uh, I use offensive language towards people, maybe, and don't realize it. Yeah. The yeah. more you know. The more you know. Um, Chris Feltz asks a serious question. How did the left go from being the leaders of free speech to a, a very intolerant mob? Ah, I believe that he is kind of referencing the, uh, the, the conservative purge that's going on on social media in terms of, like, Alex Jones and... H three podcast well, got one thing that always interests me him. is the college campus debate. Okay, you know all these like these far right wingers, kind of like you know, neo fascists. In my opinion, yeah. they they get their speaking engagements canceled at these colleges, right? And we get like those we get those blank examples. We talk about them. The right will bring them up and stuff and argue about it. But if you look at statistics, <laughs> yeah. uh, I think Vox ran a piece on this, right? Left-wing professors are more likely to get fired for talking about their political le- beliefs in class than right-wing professors. Yeah, are. and I, I would I would buy that because I think uh, um, the right-wing guys are probably the only ones that get they get the, like the coverage because they're more. Uh, well, it, it it like that Jordan Peterson guy. He's definitely he's he's definitely more right of center, but he's popular. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So you're only you're only kind of really seeing the sensational part. And I feel so, like yeah, the, yeah. I think you know. And I honestly, I just believe that the 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 media on the right, the like media institutions on the right, Breitbart, Fox News, right, stuff like that, uh, National Review, In, Infowars, <laughs> much <laughs> much better about kind of taking something and infuriating people over it, right? Yeah, you know, like it's it's kind of funny sometimes. It's hard to get the left up in arms about something. It's easy to get the left up in arms about like Nazis or about like um, gender issues, you but know. if you like actually talk about like things that like you bring up statistics. Most people are left wing in America. Yeah, you know, if you like pull people without you know including any partisan uh, clues, like seventy five percent of people say they want universal health care. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know how I feel about that. I definitely got screwed over when the Obamacare got passed. But well, yeah, I mean, you're, what are you lower class, middle class? Uh, I was making like nine bucks an hour. Yeah, whatever that is. Well, you know, that's one thing that we talk about with gentrification. Is like. When gentrification happens, rent actually goes down for the top third of the population in a city. Not really. It flattens out for the middle third, and the lower third skyrockets up. Not really. So it is discriminatory. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, man. That's it, a whole other can of worms as well. But yeah. like, uh, in terms of – you know, I, I think I, I talked about it in the last podcast or whatever, but uh, one of the things that I like Donald Trump did here recently, I love him for this, or, or love that he said this, was uh, – you can't just you you can't just silence people because you disagree with them. You know what I'm saying? You can't um, 
just decide they're not on your platform anymore because then you make that guy a martyr. Like, he needs to be made an asshole and made to know, like, everybody needs to know that guy's an asshole, like Alex Jones. I like Alex Jones a lot. I feel like if I ever met him, I would get along with him great. We'd have a beer. But a lot of the things that he says, like, dude, you, you're you're spouting off all these facts that you, first off, you're not even citing your sources. And I've caught people on, on the InfoWars websites, like, referencing Wikipedia articles, dude. Like, that's not journalistic. Well, Wikipedia theory. is, like... Pretty accurate for the most part. Yeah, but it's it's not something that that you would do uh, on a, in like a professional setting. Yeah, you know. I mean, it's more based in reality than half of what Alex Jones says. Yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, just, I just I don't I <laughs> I lose patience for people, and I know that maybe this is like a bad impulse and is anti free speech, which I don't think it is. Right. You know, like people complain about the violations of free speech when like conservatives aren't allowed to talk when milo is not allowed to talk on a college campus right because he says fucking horrible things about trans people and yeah. y- you know that's yeah. hate speech and the college is like well we don't want hate speech on here right because yeah. people are complaining about it yeah because we're tired of you coming in and pissing off all the people that yeah. are paying us money to go to this school. that's not a violation of his free speech rights uh, it's the yeah, college it's a it's a state-funded thing though i mean it's just if it was a pri- like if it's a like the um you know What's her name getting booted? What, what was because she said that girl looks like a monkey? Yeah. ABC. All right. She that was a private thing. Yeah. Uh, cut cut your losses for whatever ABC. God God bless you. I hate ABC, but um because they're owned by Disney and they own like a sixth of the world. Yeah, Disney media. is one of the worst companies yeah. in the world. Um, but uh, that's same what same thing cracks with me up. These leftists who love Disney movies. Yeah. Oh my God, grow the fuck up. Yeah. And then you tell people that you don't want to go watch Marvel movies because, oh, I don't like the Disney Corporation. They'll make fun of you. Go, go fuck yourself. Yeah. I don't want to participate. It's the same reason I'm a vegetarian. It's yeah. like, you know, you not, might not believe that it's effective, and it's not really for yeah. me to be a vegetarian. I should be a vegan, and even then that's not doing anything because you can't hold individual – like straw bands are fucking stupid yeah. because you can't hold individual people accountable. You need to hold the fucking oil companies accountable. Right. Because, or the fucking dairy industry accountable because 40% of all gas emissions come from the dairy industry. Right. And it's like if you don't hold the factories that are doing it accountable, it doesn't fucking matter if you get fucking fake cheese. Yeah, so your little temper tantrum there trying to make yourself seem like you're, you know, at top of the world, I'm a superhero, I'm going to change the world with this crap. It's it's, it's ineffective and stupid. Yeah. And it takes uh, a subject. And it's like, it's your choice to put that on yourself. And like, I'm a vegetarian, I don't watch Disney movies. And it's like, is that inconvenient for me sometimes? Yeah, it kind of is. Like, I went on a date, I I met this guy on Tinder, and he wanted to go, he was like, I'm a huge superhero fan, I want to go see uh, Ant-Man versus the Wasp, and I, or Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yeah. See, I don't even know what it's fucking called. Yeah. And I was like, I have no interest in going to see that. And I begged him to, like, go watch local, that date went horribly. Anyway. Yeah. Huge penis, though. Colton, for God's sake. It's like a dead rat. And that's appealing to you? <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't, it like wasn't a, good. Like a ferret? I threw up. Yeah, Good. Yeah, I threw Serves up you on right. That's what you get. <laughs> For what? Taking a penis in yourself, sir. No. I'm just ripping on you. Yeah. You do you. Go I, do I cocaine do. in the bathroom. I I'm probably going to go home and do mine. No, no, you do. I'm man. not feeling good. I can't go on any Tinder dates right now. Oh, okay, good. That's probably for the best. What with the you know, rat penises that have been coming your it way? Was, it was very big. Okay, here I we go. I told my friend at work about it. For God's she, sake. She lost her mind. <laughs> Back she, to myself, man. She asked me about it every day. She's like, you gone on another date with that guy yet? Like, <laughs> no, he didn't text me back for two weeks. <laughs> you know? It's because he's liking his dick to his rat, to a rat. Well, it's you don't I, like superhero movies. I didn't liken it to a rat in front of him. Uh, it was all <laughs> over your face, I bet. But don't take that and run, please. All right, going forward. Uh, at this point, I think everyone can agree Russia is fucking with us, but do people from both sides realize that Russia is... Winning by creating a greater divide between us. I think that's a good comment. That's uh, a great question, but it doesn't change my views about how awful it is that they helped Donald Trump get elected. Yeah, they do that with everybody. They hacked though. the DNC today. Did they really? Yeah, there was another attack on the DNC today. We should just nuke Russia off the face of the planet. And well, be done I mean, with we can't. You know, they still have all the nuclear weapons they had in the communist revolution. Yeah, of course they do. Yes, we do. we have video showing this. And Putin is the, the same most, video over and over. I don't know <laughs> for sure how close Putin and Trump are, but it is kind of like there's this whole debate on the left about if like liberals get too focused on the like the Russia thing yeah. and like you know focus on it too much and it's not important. And it's like okay, well let's look at the globe right now. Right. The two most powerful countries in the world are China. In the U.S., right? Okay. Okay. Well, Russia is, like, close. They're not really that strong anymore. You know, they're yeah. kind of, like, after the collapse of the Soviet, Soviet Union, Union, they kind of diminished, right? Diminished. But Vladimir Putin, if he has an in to the American president, that is the largest, 
white supremacist state in the country. They commit genocide to this day. They're like murdering gay people in the streets oh, right dude, now. Oh, dude, he's got like quotes of him like un unashamed just going out. If if there's ever um, an Islamic terrorist attack in Russia within 30 minutes, every Muslim in the borders will die. Yeah. It's nuts. Straight up. Nuts. That dude is a is like So if you believe if you're like a leftist a Godfather, man. If you're a leftist and you believe that Donald Trump is a is a white supremacist and has ties to white supremacist organizations, right. and you're not worried about an alliance between the that government and the US government and the Russian government, you're being fucking naive. Yeah, like, it's that definitely is a fantastic narrative. It, it like for sure. If that if there's any ilk to that, then yeah, there's there's definitely weight, but I don't know enough. I unplugged again. I don't know enough about it's, the It's it's pretty crowd. bad right now. I mean, like twenty seven people have been indicted on charges of conspiracy against the United States. Yeah, but have they gotten anything to stick? Yeah, they convicted Manafort yesterday and okay. Michael Cohen. Oh, I heard about. I heard they did actually get somebody yeah. to plead guilty. And Cohen said today he's going to flip on Trump. Oh, okay, okay. His all lawyer right. said that. Which so, I mean, all of them are lying all the time. You know, right? Like, yeah. The That's only one that. Lawyer. It's like Rudy Giuliani is the only one that doesn't lie, but it's because he's like incapable of like, <laughs> yeah, not revealing his like you know fucking Nosferatu ass plans underneath everything that, he does. That dude's, that dude's just weird. Cat, America's man. mayor. I seen a uh, yeah. <laughs> I seen a, a meme of him today. It was like uh, he was ripping on Trump. It, it was it was a CNN article, and it was like Giuliani. Uh, uh, America has has never been great. You know, ripping on make America great again. And then the next day, same photo and everything, the headline read, Rudy Giuliani, America has always been great. Yeah. Like, well, that's one thing, you know, we were talking about earlier. Everyone's a victim of propaganda. It's like, sometimes it's really fascinating when you get to watch both sides of the same. Yeah. You get to see. And with that right there, you're dealing with CNN's propaganda prism overlaid on top of Giuliani's propaganda prism. I don't agree with the idea that CNN is inherently leftist. I, I don't agree with the idea that. Any news form or any what's considered mainstream is, but objective. I think CNN, I think MSNBC has a left bias, but I think CNN's bias is sensationalism. It's yeah, like whatever's going to yeah. get the most views doesn't matter because they'll defend right wing people all day. Yeah, if it pisses people off. Yeah, you know that's like well, the, the New York Times is kind of the same way. Like they'll whatever is going to like get people to watch their fucking paper come out. That's yeah. what they're going to talk about. I, don't, I really don't like the AP either. I, I worked with their articles for like two years. I Associated really, Press. I yeah. read 538 and Vox. And Vox is a very, very far left lean. Yeah. But 538 is Nate Silver. And even though Nate is, you know, gay and from New York, so he's probably a liberal. Right. They're really, really good about talking about like, this is how we got these numbers. This is why we think this is going to happen. Yeah. And he gave Trump a one out of four chance of winning the election last year. Oh, did he really? Yeah, which is exactly what the odds say about the House swinging. Oh, really? It's exactly as likely. You know why? Why is that? Gerrymandering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the left has to, like, come out and vote in such an overwhelming way. There's no way we're going to win. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I, like, I think at the end of the day, um, I'm going to throw my phone outside. Go away, Matthew. McElhone. Stop texting me in the middle of a podcast, even though you don't know that we're doing it because it's not live. He'll listen to it. He'll think it's funny. I don't remember what I was saying, but. He's probably not going to listen to it. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> Anyhow. Uh, no one's going to listen to this. Next question. All right. Um, All right. Michael J. Brown says, in the age of information, we are bombarded with a live feed of tragedy 24-7. How can one navigate and prioritize their concern slash activism without becoming numb to everything and becoming completely insane? Um, grow up, Micah. There Just you. grow the fuck up. There you go. No, I get it. I, like, you know... <sighs> It's hard to expose yourself to it every day, you know, especially when, like, I believe, you know, a lot of the media is just geared towards feeling, making you feel as sensationalized as possible. Right. It's, yeah. It's so hard to expose yourself to it every day and not, like, lose your shit. And if you got to take a break, you got to take a break. Yeah, now. dude, I've, I unplugged uh, when Obama got elected because I got tired of the sensationalist crap from both sides. I was talking about Ted Nugent earlier. Remember when he hung he he hung an effigy of Obama at his concert? No, I don't. But that does not surprise me. <laughs> you know, my dad. I recently. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? No, <laughs> he did actually did it twice. Holy crap, dude! Um, Ted, and, that is not that is not civil. Yeah. You were you were better than that, sir. Well, I mean, and then one like the first three weeks, Obama, uh, Trump was in office. He brought Ted Nugent to visit the White House, and I'm like, didn't he threaten to hang the guy that was just in that fucking office? Yeah. 
That's super fucked up. <laughs> Dude, um, uh, but he also, my dad, uh, when I, you know, I didn't come out of the closet for a long time until I was like 22. Right. But one of the reasons was because my parents have expressed a couple times like pretty severe homophobia. Right. Not my mom as much, although she said some things. Back that you into like, the closet and just whip you until you're straight again. Yeah. With the belt. Anyway, my dad, uh, one time, I have this really vivid memory of him talking about Ted Nugent. And he said, uh, he's talking about seeing Ted Nugent. Of course, he saw Ted Nugent. And uh, my dad's favorite guitarist is Ace Freely from Kiss. So okay. he's the greatest guitarist of all time. Yeah. He also has seen Sasquatch three times. So he's just like a, crazy. He's a real loon. Yeah. <laughs> I love him to death. He's, he's, he's got oh, some. Oh, I already love him. I think he's, he's cool. He's got some nutty ass shit. But, uh, you know, he told me the story about seeing uh, Ted Nugent and he uh, was about to play Scat, Cat Scratch Fever. Yeah. And I remember we were alone in the truck and my dad, like, real gleefully leaned into him and he goes, Ted, uh, start right. Played one lick of the guitar, and he said, after I play this next number, even the faggots will be eating pussy. That's all. <laughs> and I was, like, looking at my dad. I was like, it's a good song, I guess. <laughs> 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 you know, as a bisexual person, I actually am a faggot that eats pussy, though. Right. So I was inspired by Ted. There, there you go, Ted. It worked. <laughs> there you go, Ted. Oh, you did some good, man. Next uh, question. Fuck that guy. Yeah, well, I like him. Uh, anyhow. Uh, does the nation have a secret hate for father figures? So that's why there is blind hate for President Trump. I don't engage people when they are arguing in bad faith. That's a bad question. Well, who asked that? Uh, Chris Feltz. He's oh, on the podcast. Quite is that the same guy that asked if I thought Hillary Clinton was Jesus? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I just want to clarify that I wasn't happy I got to vote for Hillary Clinton. I wasn't like excited about her. I do love her laugh. You ever watched her laugh? Oh, dude, I've seen. She creeps me out, man. Really? Yeah. I love her laugh. I can't I can't stand her, her she, big pearly white teeth. Her voice freaks me out. Yeah, and the pearly white teeth are fake. They they have to be fake. I mean, they're dentures. My grandma has dentures. She's yeah. still an honest person. Yeah, but she that woman comes off as fake to me. She gives me the creeps. It might yeah, be a I mean, personal thing. She's been in the public eye. We were talking about fame earlier. Right. Hillary Clinton has been in the no. public eye and the subject of more propaganda than anyone ever. Wouldn't you be reserved in front of every camera that you go in front yeah. of? Yeah. Yeah, and then when like she tried to break the reserve and she like they did that. Do you remember that in the election? Where the, she had this whole thing for like a week where she was trying to break the reserve or whatever and act all like like down to earth. And people were like, dude, you don't know how to do this. And it looked even worse. Like it looked even fake so or more fake or whatever. So she like she like rolled back on it. I don't it. remember that. She like there was one footage where or one you know video where she came out on stage and she pointed at Obama all smiley and then like. Yeah, Oof. yeah, it was, reminds. like, real cheesy, and then, like, there was another one where, like, the lights went off, and there were balloons coming down, yeah. and she was like, wow, just staring at the... You know, I'm not a huge Hillary Clinton fan, I a... hate Bill Clinton. <laughs> people always, I always bring up that, you know, Trump bragged about sexually assaulting people, and uh, I brought it up on stage once, and this woman says, uh, well, so did Bill Clinton. And he's like, yeah. And I said, yeah, they should both resign the presidency immediately. <laughs> 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 yeah, dude, my grandfather hated that guy, Bill Clinton. He hated that guy. Yeah, my dad hated him too. Yeah, there's something about the Clintons. I think it's part of it's. It's because they're gangsters, man. That's who they are. Yeah, they they do seem dishonest. But also, I mean, if you've been the like the target of you know an entire propaganda wing, forty yeah. percent of the U.S. media has been telling you everything awful about the Clintons they can possibly come up with yeah. for years. Yeah, you know, there's no way they shouldn't they shouldn't run her yeah. just because of that. Not yeah. even because of how you feel about her personal policies or if she's a bad person or a great person. Because I believe, like, when, when like, high, higher-ups in the, in the Democratic Party say that Hillary Clinton is the most qualified person every president and they think she's a real pro, like, I totally believe them when right. they say that. Because it's actually objectively true. Like, if you think about the qualifications that she had, prerequisite going into the presidency, right. there's never been a president that had more, like, a better resume. That's were, objectively true. Okay. Uh, yeah, because she was Secretary of State for X amount of years. Senator. Or there's she was, a lot of people that, that say that she was the shittiest Secretary of State ever though that's i don't think that's true she was i mean the shittiest secretary of state of all time is whoever started who whoever was in office when bush was president i don't know who it was but i think i think you look at the way the bush like people complain about donald trump he's not the worst president in u.s history right. andrew jackson is worse. george w bush truly ruined this country yeah, the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act. Uh, we went to mul – we are in 11 illegal wars right now. Dude. And he started seven of them. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, Obama what came in was like, oh, yeah, we're going to – what, what, what seriously pissed me off about Obama, what really got me was the National Defense Authorization Act, the, the, the Fast and Furious nonsense, and the fact that uh, the NSA fiasco – 
And the fact that, dude, you were supposed to get us out. You yeah. were supposed to get us out. And I didn't. totally agree with that. And I think a lot of leftists agree with that, which is why there was no, like, that's why Hillary Clinton lost. Is yeah. That, Barack Obama said we weren't going to be at war anymore. He yeah. wanted he wanted to stop the Iraq war, but we're still yeah, we're it, still in the Middle East. When he went in. When he went we're in. We're still in Afghanistan. So we were in Afghanistan before we went to Iraq. Yeah. Yeah, by a couple of years. We went to Iraq in, in 03, February 03. Yeah, we went to Afghanistan almost immediately. Yeah. And it, uh, it was all a lie. And yeah. it was all known to be a lie. Yeah. Those people knew they were lying. Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice. My dad, I remember, he said the the person I would vote for is Condoleezza Rice. He wanted Condoleezza Rice yeah. to run for president in 2008. And I said, uh, you know, she ruined this country, man. Yeah. Um, Not that we were great, super great before, but the uh, the wars in the Middle East, the it, all the U.S. government activity in the Middle East is one of the most, like, despicable things I – yeah, I, I think uh, most of my veteran buddies would probably agree with you yeah. as well. I, like, you know, uh, what in the hell are we doing here? Yeah, you know, well, and it's like, uh, and there's there's a handful of good reasons. Like y- y- once once Saddam was gone, now we got to be there because Iran's going to end up dominate dominating everything there. Well, um, I mean, who fucking cares? It, like, it, it, yeah. well, it's it, it that would be a bad thing. That would be bad, Iran but it, you know, it would be worse to destabilize the entire region for twenty fucking years. Yeah, well, we should, never should have went there to begin with. Um, I don't know, dude. It's such a, it's such a can of worms because you start looking back at the history of, of like Iraq, and we've been there since right after World War Two. Yeah, my dad fought in Iraq. Okay, we're we are <clears throat> we're the reason Saddam's in power. I'm pretty sure he was a CIA plant. Uh, same thing with with Iran. That's how come those two countries basically controlled the region for a while. Yeah. Um, I watched Fahrenheit nine eleven last night. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah, dude. I used to I used to uh, watch all of those things. I got so many of those. Bowling for Columbine holds up. It's got some real good points. I think. Is that a Michael Moore documentary? That's a Michael Moore. Okay, yeah. I got to check that one out. I really I don't like him personally. Well, you know what, dude? If I found met him, I better get along with him. But like. I don't like a lot of his ideas, but he is such a good filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, really good documentary that, maker. Roger, Roger and me, that was like, like a really good film, just to like put together. Well, or whatever. Bowling for Columbine to me is really good about talking about gun control in a way that, like, you know, like this is gonna taking guns away would help solve the problem, but there also is like a problem with our culture, you know, like it, it, yeah, and yeah, I would, and he, he definitely to. It's it's like it's it's when you're on the left, I feel like people on the left, they don't want to say that it's a problem with culture yeah. because it, you know, it kind of takes away from their argument that it could be gun related. Yeah. But you can have a nuanced opinion about it. Yeah. Um, know? And again, I, I disagree with you in terms of taking the guns away. But I, I, I tell you what, um, I can appreciate that. And I, I'll say, dude, I started learning how to shoot when I was seven years old and understanding at a, as a, at a seven year old level what death was and that I had the ability to you know distribute death with that firearm gave me a respect for life yeah and the respect for life is just not taught anywhere at all except for in the home and 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 you know the the public schools are basically like where you yeah. go to learn anyhow you know yeah. so the home home teaching really just doesn't happen anymore yeah there's definitely a, a huge lack of just respect for life I feel like, but uh, not to, you know, take it, you know, you and I obviously disagree on gun control, but, uh, right. I just think that, uh, we should start arming seven year olds with AK 47s. Next question. Uh, I don't think that that's retarded. Uh, does the nation have, Oh no, we already ran that. Uh, Michael Brown says, who's your comedic influences and what are your goals for comedy? Micah, I already asked that question. And if you were listening, you didn't known. Should yeah. I take that? Because you, you kind of ran with it, I think. Like, we answered that for you. You want me to take it? Yeah, you I'll take it. Okay. Uh, I like, uh, one of my favorite comics is Colton Jones. Uh, no, uh, actually, you're really good. And also, you helped me a lot. And, like, it let me do this bullshit where I'm trying to, like, go to your open mic on my lunch break. Yeah. So it's got to be an inconvenience for you. I cannot thank you and Joey Johnson enough for, like, letting me do that. Because I'd probably be done with comedy by now if I hadn't. As long as you seem like you give a shit, I'm not going to, like, yeah. you know, put you out. Thank you. Um... The, uh, I think Bill Hicks was probably the first comic that I've seen. Like he had a Netflix special that was released and that was the first time that I was like, I can actually do this. Yeah. Like, uh, his, I like Hicks. Yeah. His writing style is, is so close to like, so relatable and so close to what I can do. Um, and then uh, like, I, I hate using Joe Rogan's comedy as a, uh, as a, as a real thing, but 
there was a his podcast is way better than his comedy, but he had a uh, Netflix special in like 2006 that was really great. Joe Rogan was the was one with the, the tiger attack. I uh, don't no, I don't think so. He he was I don't remember what it was. I got to go look that up again because he was he, he had a bit about like uh how like the Egyptians were like moving pyramids around with their minds and they were just like like the the people that were supposed to do all the slave work were just out banging everybody. And that's how come like I don't know. It was really funny, but um. Rogan Hicks, um, I really like local guys. I like you know Micah Brown, uh, Matt McElhone. Uh, Mana's comedy is like just she murders every time. Mana's always so tight on stage. She knows exactly what she's gonna do. Yeah, it's it's crazy watching her do that because it's like, which I don't even agree with like philosophically as an approach. But that shows that you know everybody works differently. Uh, I seen Sal perform for the first Sal's time. Hilarious, dude. He got. <laughs> Uh, Twi- have you you've been to Twilight Lounge? You know that that couch that they have. He gets up on stage first off. He turns around. He's like, "Do y'all mind if I fool with this?" And he like starts playing with the thermostat. I'm like, just in shock. Like, no, they're gonna kick you out. Like, I did a show stop. with Sal once. Uh, it was a Brave Boys event, and they pulled like four of us up to do stand up instead of doing a podcast that night. Yeah. And Sal went up on stage, and he did like a 15 minute set, and he said the word "retarded" like nine times throughout his set. Like he kept fucking saying it, and every single time there would be this huge reaction to it. Like he'd be like "retarded," and people'd be like, "Ugh." And then at the end, he was about to say "bitch," and he goes, "Can I say bitch? Is that gonna make you guys uncomfortable?" And I was like, "Sal, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> bitch is way more acceptable than retarded." Dude, uh, John Brown's one of my favorites. That guy, uh, like, John's such a good writer. He's he uh, yeah. But Daniel Magden is a great writer. Uh, yeah, yeah, I like his stuff. He's about but, to move to LA. Uh, the thing with John is like. Like, he'll get up on stage and he'll start giggling at his own jokes, which yeah. makes you start giggling with yeah. him. <laughs> Nick's <laughs> real good at the laughing at my own jokes. Nick Fields? Yeah. Nick Fields, yeah. every time he laughs. He's like his own laugh track, man. It's so impressive. Yeah. But um, it's totally – it's because it's not put on. You yeah. know, it's not planned. It's like he just really – it totally comes across that the reason he's, like, saying those things is because he thinks they're really, really funny. Uh, another national guy, Bill Burr, George Carlin, uh, Eddie Murphy, the delirious that, – that specifically, delirious – that was a damn good album, dude. Have you seen yeah. that video? Uh, no, like I've a- watched Eddie Murphy when I was a lot younger. Yeah, um, his his specials are hard to watch if you're gay. Oh yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, because yeah, I'm not gay, dude. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's funny. It's like it doesn't. You know, I don't think that you like hate gay people. You clearly are uncomfortable. Just, just you a little bit, but about you know, the rat dick. Yeah, yeah, but it's like you know. I just I, there's sometimes there's some stuff you watch and you're like oh I get it you know like this is a different time That's so crazy dude Richard I never thought Richard Pryor is another one like I I I watch him and I'm like wow his technique is incredible he's yeah. so fucking intelligent but also like he talks a lot about like beating women like he does a really long bit about the difference between beating white women and beating black women and what? it's like I you know I get it it's a different time but that has not aged well and it's hard to listen to sometimes yeah I can I can see that um, uh, Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce has a handful of bits like that. Like his his take on the N word was like, uh, um, you know, just just start saying it, start saying it over and over and over yeah. again, and call everybody that, so you can take the power away from it. And then little Johnny doesn't come home and he's well, upset because uh, you know Lenny, that's not a terrible idea, but it's not really your call to make. Well, that. yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, it was he was like the first white guy to kind of say, hey, why, why, how come we don't like, yeah. you know, treat black people like they're human? Louis C.K. was saying it on stage a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, another guy. That's another guy that I thought, yeah, I can do this. Like, because yeah. he's he's just up there talking about life, man. Yeah, you know the only thing that Louis did for comedy that that really annoys me, um, because Mas- masturbating on stage. Look, you know, in front of people that that whole thing is very complicated. Uh, he uh, clearly what he did was wrong, right? But another thing that he kind of did was comics that have kids now. At especially bad open micro comics that have kids are like unlistenable because Louis C.K. had such a successful career. Right. Because they just sit there and just shit talk their kids in a way that's like not – like when Louis does it, it's like refreshing and humanizing. Yeah. But when when like, you know, bad open micers do it, it's just like uncomfortable. Yeah. And it's like – Yeah, the way Louis – like he had that bit about how uh, how his, his, his older daughter and his younger daughter interact with each other. And it's fun kind of watching it because it's like watching, you know – two cats play with each other, you know? And it was like, yeah, the, the, there was like a broken toy and the, the younger daughter wanted the older daughter to suffer because she wanted to break her toy because the, it was just like, he didn't really talk. It wasn't just a, Oh, this is what my kids do joke. It was like, this is the dynamics of my household economics yeah. joke, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was good. But 
let's let's move on from this right quick. We'll go on to the next question here. Chris Feltz says, uh, since taking office, what has Trump really done to piss off gays, minorities, and women? Damn you, Chris. <laughs> since he since he has been president, I can't tell. Uh, well, I mean, Jeff Sessions is his attorney general. So we'll just start there, yeah, I guess. Dude, Jeff Sessions is terrible. I hate that guy. Jeff Sessions is a bad... Everybody hates him. Even the God Emperor Trump guy was like, really? Sessions? <laughs> yeah. Trump, Trump, uh, Trump's pick of Sessions is a big one. Um, you know, I think just his basic corruption, right? And, uh, you know, there's a lot of basic corruption going on in the government that I think everyone should be un- uncomfortable with. Right. I mean, he picked... For me, a big thing is, like, he picked Mike Pence. And I said this, actually said this at work today. I was talking about politics at work today. Yeah. And I said, you know, Mike Pence won't let me, won't help me pay for electroconvulsive therapy because I have bipolar disorder and that's been proven to work. But he will approve <laughs> electroshock therapy because I'm bisexual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's kind of, like, insulting to ask me what I could possibly be offended about the administration. Dude, have you seen the uh, the memes where it's, like, they Photoshop Mike Pence's face onto, like, Lord Raiden from Mortal Kombat? He's all covered in lightning and just reads, absolute degeneracy. <laughs> He's he's a he's I'm kind of terrified of impeachment because Mike Pence is like oh yeah nobody actually capable of legislating <laughs> yeah because that's that's the uh that, it was you know that's the joke is uh, Pence is Trump's uh you know uh, security policy yeah if they assassinate him you get Pence well that's what you know that's the only argument I've ever heard about Trump's candidacy that really was like compelling to me right was I had a roommate who was who we had a Trump magnet on our fridge he was a big fan big uh, fan and uh, he uh. One time I asked him, I was like, what? I mean, you know, I get it. Like, you don't like Hillary Clinton, but how could you vote? And he's like, well, my whole thing is, like, I think Trump and Hillary are, like, equally disgusting people, like, in my head. Yeah. But Hillary Clinton actually knows how the government works. Yeah. And Trump has no fucking idea. <laughs> so I'm, like, less scared of him in office. Yeah, because he's, he, like, he'll get up there and just... Which is just proven to be, like, a terrible through. line of thought because he, that just means that he's, like, breaking the law and not following procedure on executive yeah, Well, yeah. Yeah. There's a catch-22. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> now he's doing scarier shit than yeah. she did. Oh, it's so funny. I think that's really like he's proof that if you just refuse to apologize for anything wrong that you do, people like there will be a section of people that will never hold you accountable. But since he's been in office, I think uh, the, the only thing that I've seen that that has kind of caused blowback from the LGBT crowd has been the uh, the reversal of like the Obama bathroom public school. The thing. bathroom ban. What, they're not they're not defending it in court anymore. Yeah. The other thing is the transgender ban on the military, and um, I guess my whole thing with that is like. I don't think that there should be a draft. So, like, Galaxy Brain, it's kind of good that transgender people aren't allowed in the military because they'll get, like, bullied and, like, you know, it's like it, – I don't think that anybody should be in our military. I don't yeah. I don't really respect what the military does. So hey, Go – I'll tell you what, man. Go talk to some veterans, like, actual – not asshole type people, but you want to go talk to somebody that are, that are real knowledgeable and real – I mean, my whole family is made up of veterans. Right, like, okay. My grandfather and, served in the Air Force. Okay. And, Okay. My friend, you know, Matt McElhone is one of my closest friends. He's yeah. A, he's a vet. Yeah, and it's I've like, never talked to him about the uh, transgender in the military thing. I'd like to get his take on it. We're going to do that next we, That's one of our biggest areas of, like, uh, kind of, like, stress. Yeah. In our, in because he, he's not for it. We're real good about talking about politics. But yeah. But we've had a couple conflicts over um, just him talking about trans people and me being like, oh, you just know, don't, think about this. <laughs> don't don't get him don't get him drunk and high and talking about religion neither. Yeah, he gets pissed. Yeah, I mean, same. Well, he doesn't get pissed, but the, the, he he's got one or two buttons. And you don't you don't touch the I'm naive enough to believe in God button with yeah. him because it'll <laughs> yeah it'll, you'll get a behavioral change out of the boy from that one real quick. Yeah. <laughs> he got a he got jumped recently. You know what, dude? Uh, I told him the night that he told me that I wish I was there, and he's like, literally everybody I told that story to said the exact same thing. I was like, oh, well, it's true, man. I, like you're such a likable guy. I don't understand why somebody would just yeah. He's real genuine, but uh, yeah, dude. Um, trans transgenders in the military, I don't I don't think it's a good idea on the basis that they're non deployable at that point. What do you mean? Uh, you cannot go to Iraq if you're going through uh hormone therapy type stuff. The yeah, reward- but people are still trans even if they're not going through hormone therapy. Well, well, um, and I, I mean. I, I'm going to really push back on you here. Okay. The actual cost of managing people who are transitioning while they're in military service right. is literally one of the least expensive things the military had to do. Okay. It is like such a small cost. Right. It's incredible that people even thought it existed. 
Because okay. the military budget, I mean, we've been talking about that all day. The military budget is so conflated. There's so much that happens. Right. And people who are in the military deserve health care. And if you have gender dysphoria, then helping you, like, take care of that is your health care. You know, when you started, I was in a disagree mode, but I can kind of I can kind of see where you're coming from a little bit better. I still hold firm on my opinion on not having them there. But, yeah, uh, if, if you're coming from the camp that this is, like, a legit medical thing that um, – you know this guy can't help it, and he needs he needs whatever for it. At the same time, at the entry level, dude, you can't have anything wrong with you when you're going in. You know what I'm saying? You can't have, and I'm not. I don't mean wrong in a moral sense. I'm saying the restrictions. You can't have flat feet. You can't. You can't have a, a crooked back. You can't yeah. have had uh, you know polio at one point in your life, even though it's gone. You can't be a pilot if. You had an inner ear infection when you were a baby because you're disqualified. You so, know? like, if you had diabetes and you had to take an insulin shot occasionally, you would be immediately discharged for that. I don't think that you would be discharged, but I don't think you would be eligible for uh, for okay. being a real. Well, in that case, if somebody is currently transitioning, maybe we can make the argument that they need to finish their health their their T routine before they you know if they're transitioning. Oh, there's uh, there's definitely some some common ground. I think you and I can 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 kind of. But if somebody's see... not no longer transitioning, then they should be allowed to serve their country, which I don't even believe that you should serve. Your country. Well, like, I can't. Really, I right. think it's good that any any reduction in the amount of people being drafted into the yeah. U.S. war machine, I'm like totally in favor yeah. of. But it is it's very problematic to sing out uh, single out trans people like that. Uh, I had a podcast with uh, Donnie Price, who is a, uh, a veteran, a combat veteran over there in Iraq for the Army, and he was he was talking about he was actually pretty uh, pretty uh, heated about it because he'd experienced it firsthand, and then he'd actually ex- experienced people getting hurt over the same kind of let's be inclusive and let's not hurt anybody kind of mentality. And what a lot of people, what his point was, and I'm not saying this is mine, this came from him, I hope I do it justice, was uh, the military exists to kill people and break their shit. And that it is not a nice thing. It is not a, it is not a, it is a very evil machine that exists for a very specific purpose. And if you're factoring in people's rights in terms of allowing people to serve one way or the other, it's just not going to work because it's it, it's a different situation. You're under a whole different set of laws when you're in when you're in the military. Uh, you get your own separate tribunal or whatever. It, like, yeah, but I still think that communicates. Like, I, I get it, I get it, right? And if 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 that's the point, then yeah, that's a good point. But it still communicates this idea that trans people are like less than or inhibited in some way. Okay, I can see that. And that's I, not really like accurate. Right, like, like, uh, Caitlyn Jenner was one of the greatest athletes in American history. Right, she's trans, you know. As as Bruce Jenner though, but when she went through the uh, well, that's because she doesn't play sports anymore. Now she doesn't play sports. She can, I bet she can still run. The moral of the story is. By the way, if I was really being like a pushy leftist on this, <laughs> I would say, I would say, well, she was going by Bruce because she hadn't come out yet. Okay, yeah, but did she had did. Was Caitlyn in the brain of this person? Yeah, at that that's, time. Do you know, do you know the, the the band against me? No, I don't. Have I gotta ever, check them out. Okay, so I still in, got that booby lighter you gave me. Oh, really? Yeah, that band's good too. Um, I can't remember what they're called, but they're a local band. They're pretty good. And uh, against me, their lead singer, Laura Jane Grace. Uh, uh, their first five studio albums, she was still living as a man when they wrote them. Okay, and then she transitioned. But if you go back and you listen to those lyrics off yeah. those albums. It's very clear that she is struggling with gender dysphoria. Oh, really? Very clear. Yeah, On yeah. her first album, uh, she says, you know, presenting as a male, she says something like, I should have been born a woman. And it's like part of the chorus of the uh, song. Oh, okay. So your, your kind of point for this kind of uh, bunny, bunny trail is, is that like Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner, whatever, even... Even pre-transition? Right. It, that person is still struggling with gender dysphoria. They're just not... Uh, they're not okay. They don't feel safe so communicating. So even when he was... When he was Manly man on the on the box of Wheaties or whatever. He's still going through. Still okay. felt like huh. he should have been born a woman. Do you think that's that's traumatically uh, triggered? There's probably uh, that's a different discussion. But like, because he he definitely ran over somebody. I don't know. Because he's straight up. I he, don't know. He's straight up hit and ran somebody manslaughter. And he that's like I said earlier. You know, I can like tell you how to respectfully talk to trans people. Yeah. But I don't know enough about gender theory to like go into it and explain. Oh. Why? It is an interesting thought. I, was, I had a friend of mine that has diabetes now, and her diabetes was triggered by her getting into a, into a dirt bike that accident. That can happen. Which is crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, the, nobody knows what causes yeah. transgender, you know, gender dysphoria. Nobody knows. So, But I, there's, 
see, the thing is, is that it's super problematic to call it a mental disorder because it's very like derivative. Well, you know? even even at the there's a lot of guys that came from the old school camp was like the only reason why they said uh, uh, mental disorder was because they wanted uh, people to be more accepting of the LGBT crowd. Like originally, because it used to be okay, you're gay, we're gonna we're gonna put you down because that's a decision. And then they said mental disorder, so I don't have control over this. That's yeah. that's what well, being gay that. is not a mental disorder. It's like a genetic thing or. The it's pre-hypothalamus a, is, is kind of what dictates whether or not you're attracted to opposite sex. Well. It's just a part of your brain. That's what I read the other day. I don't know much more about like it. the hypophallus. I guess <laughs> rat dick. We should move on to the next question, sir. Yeah, we should. <laughs> um, why do I cry in movies? Chris Feltz. Um, probably because you're a bitch. You're next question. A, emotional response to a movie. Yeah, there we go. Uh, actually you're like, 50% more likely to cry in a movie if one of the characters on screen is crying because you're really just copying the emotions of what you're seeing. All right. When you watch a movie, you're just like, it's the most monkey like your brain ever it's gets. It's kind of like if you see somebody yawn, you yawn. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, Behavior mirroring. Uh, can we get, oh, why do I love love songs so much, says Chris? Um, I don't know, but you should listen to Go to Town by Doja Cat. And also you should listen to Let Me Count the Ways I Love You by Yoko Ono. Okay. Good, good response. Next question: uh, Can we agree, Atlas Cloud Atlas is the greatest love story of all time? I never saw it, but probably not. No, it probably isn't very yeah, good. What about Romeo and Juliet? The Wachowskis are their movies have gotten so bad. Yeah, I, I loved The Matrix, the first Matrix. I still think that movie holds up pretty well. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've been saying, I always say like your image, your self image, right? It's your Matrix brain, yeah, your image of yourself. I think that's especially with Facebook. I think. People are so aware of that dichotomy now of like how you see yourself versus how you actually are. Yeah. Especially uh, somebody who struggled with gender dysphoria. That's very fascinating to me because yeah. I remember like weighing myself and like thinking the weight, the way thing is broken, even though it still says like 260. I'm like, no, I weigh like 300 pounds. Yeah. You know? And it's like, uh, did I say gender dysphoria? I meant body dysmorphia. Yeah. It doesn't fucking matter. It's the same thing. And I guess that's something that I can't argue with. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's the same thing. There's certainly, there's certainly along the same. Colin, kind of, you're gay because you're fat, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm gay because I'm fat. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that's probably not true. No, I'm, it's more like I'm gay despite the fact that I'm fat. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. We, um, let's move. Let's move on. We'll just hit it a little bit here. Keep them coming. Rapid fire. Okay, Michael Brown says. What would be your strategies for combating climate change if the UN were to call you tomorrow? I like I said earlier, corporate responsibility for what is being done to the environment is the most important thing. We can do straw bans, we can be vegetarians, we can fucking like not drive, we can like get bikes, but like uh, your carbon footprint doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. You know, BPs does. Like yeah. and that's what needs to be corrected. Yeah. That's why I was really disappointed when Trump pulled out of the climate change agreement. Not because it was actually doing anything. Right. And we've actually like because the states reacted so heavily against uh -huh. that, we've actually stayed under what we would have tried to achieve in the Paris climate agreement, yeah. which is like fair enough, you know, like we didn't need to be in there. But at the same time, it's like that's kind of because the states, like a lot of governors came said, like, we're reacting to this. We're going to – California started passing legislation to, you know, coal, all kinds of stuff, uh, uh, environmental, yeah. you know. And it's – it's climate change is done. Like it's happened. Yep. Like it's it's in motion. Oh, I've seen the uh, – uh, it was like a year ago that we like passed the point of no return supposedly. Yeah. It's done. It's over. Yeah. And unless we like completely change the way our economy works, yeah. we're going to have to go to Mars or something because yeah. we're we're literally ruining the planet. Which would be great. But if we figure out how to get to Mars, then we can figure out how to fix this climate change shit. You know, I don't know that it's easier to get to Mars than it is to pull oil out of the ocean. I don't know which one's hard. I imagine it's actually easier to get to Mars. Yeah. I don't know. It, we, we know more about the solar system around us than we know about the ocean. Yeah. You yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Actually, you know what? Uh, uh, I'll buy that. Yeah, and one of the biggest kind of like additions to the heat rising is the amount of plastic that we've and oil that we throw into the ocean because it reflects that heat right back at the ozone. That's okay. not good for the atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the science behind none of that. I really need to get like way more educated on like environmental biology. I just don't. I I think one thing that we could do is instead of asking politicians if they believe in climate science, ask them what they're going to do about it. 
Yeah, I'm kind of like done pretending that it's a real opinion somebody can have because it's just like it's you're it, you're argu- like to me you're probably arguing a bad faith if you don't believe in climate change. Like I don't understand how you how that's still somebody's viewpoint. It's the same thing as anti-vaxxing though. Yeah, but it's our flat Earth, and it's like you know that's why people like I think that's why people get so upset about flat Earth. Yeah, because it's just like this refusal to listen to reality around you. And I think people who are, like, in these different political realities, they feel that a lot. So, like, my dad believes in Bigfoot. And one thing I always try to talk about on stage is that trying to convince someone that Bigfoot's not real is exactly the same as trying to get them to not vote Republican. Because your realities are different. Your reality – like, you're living in different worldviews, you know? Uh, Trying to use reason with someone who who won't use it is like administering medicine to the dead. And also people are so tribal. Like, my dad will not listen to me. Yeah. He, he refuses to consider the idea that Bigfoot's not real because it is part of his identity. Oh, uh, okay. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've run into that. Yeah. yeah. And it's like it's so a part of your belief systems that you've become emotionally attached to that belief. So if we can just get rid of this idea that you can not believe in climate change, I think that would do a lot of work because people would just be like, oh, yeah, we're assuming that it's real. Well, let's move on from there. Yeah. You know, it's more about where you start an argument than where you argue, too. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with how you frame it. Dude, normally these AMAs are just silly nonsense, but you were definitely, like, hitting these with, like, real thoughts, and it's a nice change of pace, because I normally just, like, bullshit through these. All your, all your listeners are going to be like, this guy's fucking boring, bro. Yeah, this guy's smart and d- d- not funny. We get it. You read Vox, you piece yeah, of shit. Yeah, you leftist whatever. <laughs> Why don't you take your gay liberal agenda and put it in a hole that isn't your butt, because clearly you've had enough of that. I saw something the other day, and it was like, are bi people born with high waisted pants and a nose ring, or is that part of their agenda? <laughs> <laughs> and then there was another one that was really funny. It was a tweet, and it said, uh, I- I- "You're not if you're straight, you're not gay, even if you like the Smiths." <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't even know what the Smiths are. You don't know the Smiths? Uh, uh-uh. uh, dude, you're gonna have a whole list of media that I'm gonna have to check out right after. I this. am human, and I want to belong, just like everybody else. Next question. All right. Uh, <laughs> Micah Brown says, how do that rabbits rank? Uh huh. That might be the cure, actually. Oh, but. I don't know. It could be. I know of the cure. I think I've seen them really? once at like a Marilyn Manson concert. I think they were there. That sounds roughly right. Uh, either them or, or Bullet from My Valentine. I might They're be more, mixing those two bands probably up. Bullet from My Valentine. Yeah. Cure is more like OG goth before it was all metal related. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Like Sisters of Mercy or whatever. Which is what Marilyn Manson did to goth. Yeah, kinda. he was like the he was the hybrid. Yeah. He was the original blade, the original vampire. How do rabbits rank as pets compared to cats and dogs? Mike rabbits Brown. have so much personality. People don't know that. Yeah. I kept a rabbit for a long time named Pablo. He was very cute. Yeah. Um, but he died. Yeah. Um, which was a very sad day when Pablo right. died. But uh, now I live with my current roommate. He's a magician and he has like three ma- rabbits that run around the house. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, rabbits make pretty decent stew from what I'm I'm told. Well, they're you like know, one of those weird animals where you, that you can I don't feel bad about eating them and I don't feel bad about having them as a pet. It's strange. Yeah. So people don't eat dogs. That's always kind of what drives me crazy being a vegetarian is people will be like you can't eat dogs and I'm like um, is that really worse than eating a cow? Cows are smarter than dogs. Yeah. You're like taking more sentience away from something when well, you slaughter I don't know a cow. How, uh, dude, I grew up on a cattle ranch. I don't know how much smarter. You know, like, uh, I've seen a calf reach in between his mother's hind legs and get milk from her udder, and she lifted her tail up and took a shit on his head, and then he wore that shit like a hat and frolicked through the field as though it were nothing. I've seen this happen on multiple occasions. Well, you know, you're supposed to shit on your baby when you have one if you're a human. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Dude, you're serious, huh? Because I think I've read that somewhere. Yeah. A lot of babies, like, when they're, like, born, a lot of women will shit at the same time. Yeah. And it's believed that's, like, a natural response to try and give the baby some, uh, some immunity. Like, immunity. Kind of like like a vaccine Work will, like, make you sick bit. first, and then yeah. you, you build up resistance. Because babies aren't as, like, they're, like, more susceptible to disease, but they're also, like, more likely to receive, like, uh immunity ladies and gentlemen do not poop on your babies when they are born chris felt i'm looking at you just Next have a question. baby into the shit that's what you got to do right yeah you gotta shit first baby second yeah yeah chris have you ever done that he's not here so he'll ask uh don't you have a show at seven you have a show at seven don't you no you're on that i'm not going i don't feel good oh crap i have a business meeting i said i would go there oh yeah your yeah. meetings at seven yeah meetings at seven. Oh shit ish it's okay. They they know what's going on. I'll show up. It's like an open mic situation, right? Uh, no, it's a showcase. Oh, crap. Well, I didn't get the. Well, it's supposed to go till nine. Okay. All right. Well, they'll they'll work with me then. 
If nothing else, you might just message Alia and let her know what's up. Okay, I don't think I have her info. I'll get I'll get it though. Uh, the plantar wart I got from Afghanistan six years ago won't go away. I tried burning it off, freezing it, cutting it off, dousing it in alcohol, but it won't go away. That's just what Chris said. That's not even a question. Micah says, "Have you tried apple cider apple cider vinegar?" And Chris said, "Nope, but I will now. Thank you. That was self-contained." Um, I'm a big believer in apple cider vinegar. Actually, if you keep rabbits and they start to develop an ear infection, which they're very wont to do, yeah, that makes sense, right? Uh, my vet told me that I could use apple cider vinegar and it'd be more effective than any prescription she had for me. So, uh, like, you just put it on a Q-tip and dip it in the rabbit's ear. That'll help you keep it clean. Dude, it's crazy how much like just like simple shit like that can help yeah. you. Like, it's, it's, it's well, insane. and then the dangerous thing about that is that sometimes you hear something and you're like, well, that kind of stuff always works, and then you like try it and it doesn't work, and right, you're still sick two days later. But uh, uh, Joshua Eaton says, is Hillary Clinton sec- secretly Jesus? Um, well, no, because Jesus is black. Yeah, racist. A Jew. Hillary Clinton's not a Jew. She's a Methodist, I think. I don't know what she is. She's the devil. She's definitely Methodist. Devil Satan. Uh, Michael Brown asked. Actually, the Antichrist was Jamie Kennedy. Yeah. So that's why none of us will be saved, because we let the Antichrist make Malibu's most wanted. All right. We couldn't have had that. That was bad. <laughs> Malibu. That's Mal- you ever seen that? Town. Nope. Oh, it's such a mess. Yeah. That movie's a mess. All right. All right. Uh, Michael Brown says, what should I tell my son if he comes home and expresses interest in pursuing stand-up comedy? Don't. Uh, You know what, Um, Micah? Please just don't have a child. Yeah. Micah. (laughs) Micah also. (laughs) I'm so sorry. I don't know, man. Like, go do an open mic and see what it's like. That's definitely what you should do. Talking to you, Micah. Uh, Micah, dreams, dream nominees for the 2020 election. Yeah, Donald Trump, Mike Pence, let's do this. <laughs> Woo! Uh, my pick was not Elizabeth Warren because I think she's a little too old. She's right. not really that compelling. Uh, but after reading her bill that she put out yesterday, I'm going to have to say that right now it's Elizabeth Warren for me. Okay. Because I think a lot of the things that Trump appealed about, you know, the, the system is rigged. I'm going to unrig it because I know how it works. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren actually – like a theorist of capitalism. That's what she did for 40 fucking years before she got into politics. She's a professor in Massachusetts teaching like how capitalism works. Mm. And if she's going to write a bill, that's going to help us fix some of the problems with it. She might actually be somebody who is willing to unrig the system. She's not elite either. I mean, she's an elite now because she's been in Senate for 30 years, but she's not really connected. She has a very low amount of money compared and she doesn't take super PAC money either. She's worth looking into for sure. She is. The that's, Pocahontas thing bothers me. That's what I remembered. That's how I know her name. Yeah. The Pocahontas thing bothers me, but also it's kind of funny to have Trump constantly bring it up because it seems like the kind of thing that leftists would be mad about, yeah. not the right. The right would be like, yeah, who fucking cares? You know, yeah. you yeah. lied about having a little bit in you. But uh, I well, don't actually uh, know that she lied. The right the right was like, uh, like, gosh, she's a hypocrite because she does. I don't know, who cares? Do you, you know, I cares? feel a lot of times like there was the thing with Sarah Zhang. She recently went from Vox to the New York Times and she had a bunch of tweets about hating white people. Yeah. And people were like complaining about it as if it was equal to like a white person saying a bunch of horrible things about Asians. She's Asians. And it's like, yeah, I mean, if you completely remove all context, then, yeah, it makes sense that she's calling for genocide against white people. But <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, no, man, I think that one right there, that's a that's a good way to not like that lady. Like, she she said hashtag cancel white people. Yeah, hashtag fuck you, bitch. <laughs> fuck off. Uh Joshua Eaton asks, how many genders are there? Two moving forward. Unless you I don't a- agree with that. Okay, good. Jer- there is no one gender. Gender is a is a spectrum. I am one. Uh and uh also uh social construct. There you go. Sex. There are two sexes. You've heard it. You've heard it. Gender is a social construct. Okay. Um, I've seen, uh, what's his name? Bill Nye do that. I want to read more about that, dude. I'm so un- unread on that spectrum. You know what I'm I saying? I mean, it's the same thing. Like It's like I said earlier. Well, I understand like, the argument, but I would like to read people that know what they're talking about. You know do you what know who like, Ariel Norman is? Uh-uh. From She's genderqueer. She uses they, them pronouns. Right. But she has a podcast called Gender Fluids. Yeah. It's very good. Very okay. interesting. She's also she tends to be That's a little easy bit. To remember, she tends to be a little bit um, kind of towards the middle personally. Gender but she is gender queer. nasty. <laughs> gender fluids. It's a good name. She's funny. She's really funny. Okay. Uh, Michael Brown says, "What are your thoughts on the afterlife?" Uh, so my whole thing is I was raised Catholic, and I don't oh, know that explains everything. Yeah, especially the molestation. Right. Just kidding. I wasn't molested. Well, you should have been by a priest. Um. <laughs> Uh, 
sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I was raised Catholic, so that's the, you know, I kind of believe in a higher power overall. So bad, man. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I uh, I don't know how I would communicate with a higher power. If there's something that can truly, like, control my fate, there's no way I would ever be able to communicate with it. And if I'm going to thank it for shit because I'm, like, you know, you know, just in that mood that I need to pray or I'm, like, crying or something. Yeah. I'm going to use the Catholic language because it's the one I was taught. Kind yeah. of, but I don't know if I actually believe that it's a you know Judeo-Christian God. I think if we're operating on the assumption that the Judeo-Christian God uh, created us and that uh, we're also kind of uh, thinking that we can't reach out to him, we can't create with him. I mean, that's what so the founding advanced, fathers kind of believed is, is the, uh, de- the deist, deism. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that uh, this all-powerful, omnipotent being would have been able to program you with a with a with an input output receptor to to communicate with them, i think one Not impotent that, god huh impotent god it's, it's jesus but he can't get an erection that's uh jesus moving forward <laughs> <laughs> one time one time i i had this coworker, and uh he uh he brought up his grandpa and he found viagra in his grandpa's room and i went around telling everyone at the work to go uh, say their, you know, like, uh, what is it? Not salutations. They're like, go, like, pat him on the back, say it's going to be all right because his grandpa is incontinent. That's terrible. <laughs> Couldn't get an erection. Yeah. So everybody walked up to this guy over the course of a day at work and, like, apologized because his grandpa couldn't get an erection. They were like, we're sorry for your loss. <laughs> South Park had an episode where they did that. Where they oh, really? Like, they uh, they stole uh, they stole uh, like one of the dads Viagra because uh, they they wanted to resurrect Con- Cartman or something like that, and they were trying to give him an erection. And they mixed the words up. Yeah, I don't know. It was just a terrible joke. Joshua Eaton asks: Is applesauce just chunky apple juice? Yeah, I'm a big applesauce fan. But I, uh, I haven't had applesauce in a really long time. I do remember liking it when I was a kid, but uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Chunky apple juice. I like it. Do blenders make uh, the concept of teeth obsolete? Says Michael J. Brown. Micah J. Brown. Micah. Not Michael. Do blenders make the concept of teeth? No, I mean, I can't believe I'm actually going to answer this question seriously. But <laughs> texture is like the most important thing when it comes to food, except for how it looks and right. smells. But, like yeah. the least important thing is what your taste buds are telling you, really. It's like texture and smell. Okay. I think, uh, I think taste. I don't know, man. Uh, I just like eating food. I've general. just worked in a lot of kitchens, some high-end kitchens, and uh, every good chef, chef I've ever known has said, if it doesn't look good when you look at it, it's not going to taste good when you eat it. Yeah, because there's a whole perception thing in your brain, I imagine. There's probably yeah. a scientific reason behind that. It doesn't surprise me at all. My cousin's a chef. I talk to him about this stuff all the time. Uh, Joshua Eaton asks, should Darwin Awards be an Olympic sport? Yeah, uh, I would watch him. I remember the Darwin Awards. What was that show, Thousand Ways to Die? Or the thousand and one stupidest ways to die, dumbest ways to die, hundred and one hundred ways to die. Uh, there was a show on Spike TV. Oh uh, yeah, around yeah, the same yeah, time yeah, as Fear the Factor. Shitty animation show. Yeah, that people... shit was pretty good. Yeah, it was pretty watchable. So it was cool. I do remember that. I don't even watch TV anymore. Netflix, if you're listening, that. get that on there. Yeah, there you go. I'm trying to waste some time. Uh, should public executions be brought brought back? No, Joshua Eaton. Only no. for the uh, state should never execute anyone, only, no matter what they do. Only for like transgenders, I think maybe. Yeah. No, Colton just shook his head like it irked him because he knows I'm bullshitting, but it still kind of wants to punch me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> um, well, what, I actually talked about uh, public executions with, on, on the podcast with Shiva, so go check that out on my YouTube, and uh, it'll be good. Uh, what started the pussification of mankind? Joshua Eaton. Um, uh, chemicals in the water. Maybe the idea that half of mankind is woman. Yeah, yeah. There you go, Josh. It's 51% vagina. Pussy, so. Next question. Listen uh, to Doja Cat, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua Eaton says, Obama put race relations back over 100 years, not a question, just a fact. And then somebody loved reacted it. I'm just going to scroll on. <laughs> yeah, that's not true. What? 100 years ago? We're, did we own slaves 100 years ago? Is that... No, it was 150 years. Obama ago. put race relations back because he's black and he was in the White House. Yeah, well, he, I, I go off on a tangent. I didn't care for the fact that he picked uh, Michael Brown as his guy 
instead of uh, the kid that uh, was it Trayvon Martin that got that got shot by. I the mean, age? he did a fucking speech where he would break into tears twice, three yeah. times. It seemed like it pissed a lot I remember of he talked off. about that a lot. He talked about fake. him and John Favreau, who was his speechwriter. John Favreau talks about this quite a bit about having private meetings where Obama were. That's not the same guy that directed Iron. No, 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 no. It's a different guy. Same name. And right. actually, his other lead speechwriter was named John Lovett. Oh, really? Yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. funny. Um, so John Lovett is fucking hilarious. Yeah. Um, he's 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 got a podcast called Love It or Leave It. That's really funny. Okay. If you like if you like leftist game shows. <laughs> um, oh, what was I gonna say? John Favreau said that often when he was writing speeches about school shootings or acts of violence against you know unarmed black people by police, at a certain point. Uh, Obama just reached such a rate of exhaustion of having to talk about it so often yeah. that they didn't really know what to do. Like they, they, there was a couple speeches where they felt like they flubbed them because they were just having to write the same speech again. Yeah, and it's like you can kind of sympathize with that. I mean, it's like when you know, like there are things that Donald Trump says that are racist, right? But there are also things that he just kind of misspeaks, and then people run away with it. Yeah, like the thing about the Mexican judge, right? He didn't say that that guy couldn't be a good judge because he's Mexican. He said he's biased against the wall because he's of Mexican heritage. Yeah, which is like a kind of a reprehensible thing to say, but it's not racist. He's not saying that he can't do it because he's Mexican. He's saying like, yeah, I'm 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 enacting policy against Mexico that's really really unpopular, and this guy's family is from Mexico. And he knows immigrants. Like All he's right. going to be biased against me. And Same, it's like, yeah, that's not racist. That's not a racist thing to say. It is racist to say that most like immigrants from Mexico are rapists. Right. Like that's a racist thing to say. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm not saying that Trump's not racist. Because come on, I mean, and some no. I assume are good people. <laughs> some I assume are good people. <laughs> oh my god, that's like when my dad. Once I, I love I, him. Me and my dad were eating breakfast, and he just we we were talking about Middle Eastern people. And he just said, because uh, I was actually dating someone who was uh, Indian, which, you know, to white people is Middle Eastern. Okay. And uh, he said, uh, they're just really arrogant. And I was like, Dad, that is a fucking racist thing to say. Yeah, but not altogether untrue, though. I've Everybody's like, arrogant. I don't want to hear that. Shit ton of – well, okay, so there's – there's a there's a certain brand of toughness that you can get from each city. Like New York toughness is different from Texas toughness is different from London toughness or whatever. Same okay. thing with arrogance. There's different flavors of arrogance. And Indian arrogance definitely has its own kind of flavor to it. I totally it's, don't agree with that. Okay. We'll definitely – we'll yeah, I need to articulate this a little bit better. But I've, it, I've, you, If you are assigning personality traits in broad to groups of people – Not groups of people but regions and, and – and, uh, Yeah, I don't believe in that. I okay. don't believe that. I think that I mean you can say that there's a nature question. Like if you grow up in a in a government that uh you know, like like if you grew up in the Soviet Union, yeah, right? Maybe some of your beliefs are like in line with the government because the government is part of your life. But it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with regionally where you were born or what color your skin is. Like that's that's coincidental. Kind yeah. of there yeah. is no evidence that the level of melanin in your skin has any effect on your body biology. Yeah, I can I can kind of go with that, but what I'm saying is like like <clears throat> there's English food, there's American food. It, it's it's not unreasonable there's to Indian say that there be English behavior and American behavior. Well, I mean, yeah, like you can say that like you can say that like English people act a certain way, I suppose, but to say that a group of people are arrogant in yeah. mass. Yeah, see it's, it, okay, there's this this is where there's we're going. Like a, I don't think the, that they're necessarily they're all arrogant or they're necessarily even some ar- people that have tendencies to be arrogant or arrogant themselves. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying that like, if there's an Indian guy that comes off a certain way to me as arrogant, like, and I've experienced that before with that same kind of, it's not the, you shouldn't, like, you shouldn't be throughout your life comparing and contrasting people who have the same skin tone with each other. Right. That is like, it's a waste of time. Yeah. There's no science to back it up that it's an important observation to have. Okay. And it, I think that if you're find yourself having those kinds of observations, you should like check it. You should check yourself. Yeah. And say like, you know, I'm there's no science to support this at all. Yeah. To s- support the belief that people are different because of their skin color. Cultures are different, but that's like if he had said like Indian culture is really arrogant, that's still like a, you know, it's still like a dumb thing to say kind of because it's objectively not true. Right. I mean, right. Like, I don't know. No, man. No. Nah. There's no there's no reason to have said that to have like there it's it's your brain being tribal and trying to correlate things that there are no correlation to because it, it helps you like store information. Like you only have so much memory in your brain, and if you can make like 
correlate like race groups together. It allows it is like how your brain is working because of your tribal nature and because it allows you to store like information about people. Right. But it's not good. It's human nature, but it's a bad thing. And it like if people say something like that, yeah, I think you should you have a like a you have the right to be like, hey, it's fucked up. Yeah, you're wrong. And this yeah. is why you should check yourself and become better. I'm I'm down with that. I'm down with that school of thought. I'll definitely re examine. I can't promise that I'll change my uh my uh opinion on the thing, but I'll definitely re examine it in a in a in a good faith type way. Um Matt McElhone asks, what are your least favorite types of audiences? Indian people. <laughs> <laughs> the sigh that I just got was worth the ignorant shit that I just said. I'm sorry, y'all. I had to. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, Matt, I try to like find a way to work with every audience, but... Um, my least favorite type of audience is the 12 open micers who have all heard my set before because, you know, a lot of times I'll just, if that's the case, if it's like the, there's low turnout audience turnout at an open mic, I, I just don't even do your fucking jokes guys. Cause nobody wants to listen to each other. You know, like let's all do improv material or something like Dude, that. Dude. Yeah. I did the same thing with Dusty's the other day. I hated that. I thought it was the worst set that I'd ever delivered because it was just John Brown uh, Robert Bender. There's no Sal way that that would ever there. be rewarding for you. And there was like one more guy that was like, and she, he wasn't even listening. He was like playing like, trivia on the dead. TV. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, to my credit, the, the bartender came up to me. He was like, dude, I've been watching you for a while. Robert over at Dusty's go yeah. take that guy. He was like, uh, that was the, that's the best set I've ever seen you do. I was like, what? Like, yeah. he's, like so yeah, I definitely hate I hate doing that for people that already know what's going on. There's only four people in the bar. I think that's the worst. It's just a not. There's no way it's going to be rewarding. There's not in if you're doing like rope material. There's it's, it's not rewarding, right? Um, Joshua Eaton said, Bla "Brave Little Toasters, greatest movie of all time." I agree also, with that kind oh. of. Although I'm a big Oliver and Company cheer. Yeah, Oliver and Company. Billy Joel did the soundtrack. Oh, really? That's cool. That's actually really cool. I like it when they do... Like, One of my favorite Billy Joel songs about that movie. Why should I worry? Why should I care? I love Billy Joel. Yeah, Billy Joel's uh, The Piano Man is like one of the greatest songs of all time, period. Yeah. Hands down. Um, What's your favorite Elton John song? <sighs> This song, I think, and then followed by uh, the one where he's talking about going to Mars, maybe, Rocket Man. Oh, mine's Crocodile Rock. I don't know about Elton John very much. I know like the super hits. Do you remember when we was young? He Me and Susie had so much fun. Oh. Holding hands and skipping stones. Who did that uh, That song, Old Timer Rock and Roll? Was it Billy Joel? Is that that old timer rock and roll? No, that's some southern rock band. <laughs> I almost said Molly Hatchet, but that's definitely not wrong. But, uh... Opinion on James Cameron screaming at a fan saying, I don't owe you a damn thing. He's right. Josh Eaton. He is right. You know, uh, your fans, you better please them if you want to keep selling. But as somebody whose favorite band has been say anything for years, sometimes your creative favorite makes some shit and you just got to like not get mad at them for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, man. My, uh, my computer is just like splitting the screen in half. There we go. Uh, Josh Eaton says, can you use the saying literally Hitler for other things besides people on the right? Like pineapple pizza is literally Hitler. Just a thought this up now. And I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be doing this. He hates pineapple pizza. And I think it's amazing. Um, first off, pineapple pizza is fine. Second off. Um, what is that clause? It's a, it's a rule of writing. Godwin's law. Ah, uh, yeah, that if you're like you're arguing enough, that inevitably it'll get to be compared to Hitler. Yeah. And I think the idea is that as soon as you're arguing, you're comparing to Hitler, you're not like there's no agreement that somebody's going to come to. It's right. like as soon as you're comparing things to Hitler, you know, or the Nazi party. But the thing is, is that the right is like, like, <laughs> like it's kind of like it, it just seems argued in bad faith. Like th there are people marching on st at the state capitol last year, yeah. literally holding like Nazi flags up in the air, and then to like. Say, like, oh, well, how come you don't compare the left to Hitler? It's like, well, they're not using his flag, <laughs> you yeah. know? You know, and it's like you can say that, you know, oh, that's not how that works or whatever. But 
if you're idolizing white supremacists, you are a white supremacist. The the, uh, the Kekistani guys. There, there's a there's a there's a uh, an argument against that, or, or like an offshoot outlier argument. Uh, outlier podcast. Um, so the alt right pages that I follow, a lot of those guys got tired of being called Nazis. So they they took a Nazi flag and painted it green instead of red, and took the the swastika out of the the, the circle and put a Pepe the Frog there. And then in the corner, they put like a 4chan logo and started sporting that. They just kind of say, fuck you. No, I'm not. But if you're going to pretend that I am, then here's this crazy flag. They did. I just don't understand. It's an anti-sensationalist um, ransacking of, of fascist. But, like, they, but people on the, the alt-right is supporting white supremacy. In mass, uh, not 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 the ones that I'm I'm following. Not these kids. If they are, they don't realize that's what they're doing. Exactly. You know Everybody's a victim of propaganda, John. Right, right, right. But and I, it's like I, I think I, there's something to be said for like, hey, we're taking it back. Or like, no, fuck that. I don't. I don't. The only reason to take it back is because you idolize something about it. It's like the same thing as like, <laughs> like liking Andrew Jackson because he canceled the national bank for 75 years yeah it's like i mean i guess that you can say that like oh yeah we wouldn't have the volkswagen bug if it wasn't for hitler that doesn't make me think that it's cool to like like hitler right <laughs> right yeah all right it's like but uh in terms of like just like flags and symbolism and crap like that i feel like the consequences of doing that are just you're like responsible straight. for the things you say in the messages you oh, use for sure especially when you're taking political action for sure and uh you definitely kind of diminish yourself if you're not coming off as a reasonable person if you're sporting a nazi flag that's been like re whatevered then you're gonna come off like an asshole yeah unless somebody gets the joke and even then it's between you and them <laughs> but <laughs> It's, I don't well, know, it's man. like if you want to talk about how people should be treated, I don't want you to make jokes and like sarcastically associate yourself with Nazis. Right. Like it's not fucking funny. Yeah. Pe people – genocide is not like like something to play with. No, it's scary and it's real. Yeah. Yeah. White supremacy is not something to play with because white supremacists control the government right now. Yeah. But Jeff Sessions is the attorney general. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you that. Jeff Sessions is definitely uh, – uh, I've seen this meme of him uh, – it was like he was talking crap about marijuana because he didn't want uh, black people square dancing with uh, white women, something like that. Like, some, <laughs> but it's not that far from the truth, dude. Like that guy's that guy's nuts. Yeah. Um. Uh, Chris Phil says, uh, "Why does my wife like me, but my kids love me?" Um. Isn't that the guy who asked if Hillary Clinton was Jesus? That's one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why your wife wouldn't like you. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question, man. Uh, Mitch Padgett, uh, ask him if his girlfriend is a righty or a lefty. I'm single. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know where you were going with that, Mitch, but there you go, bub. Uh, somebody bombarded. Okay, how did you get shorter after high school? Did you drink a lot of coffee? Is that a thing? Shanae Sutter. I do drink a lot of coffee. Um, you won't get shorter, but if you're not done growing yet and you start ingesting coffee every day, it will stunt your growth. That's true. Uh, I don't think I got shorter, but I definitely got more fat. So maybe that's what you're thinking. Uh, Sinead Sutter also asked, when you walk outside and there's a cute little kitten and you try to pet it, but it doesn't let you, so you just give up and go on about your day. And then when you get home, it is still there and it tries to pet you and you don't let it because that's weird. Then you take a dump and a dinosaur, what then? Kill the cat. And the yeah, most I would just say that you need to be listening to more Doja Cat. Yeah, gruesome, gruesome way possible. Go out there with a tire iron and just bend that thing over top of that cat's head. It's the only way to solve that problem, Sinead. And I'm glad that you asked, and I'm glad I could help. Uh, Joshua Eaton says Powerade or Gatorade? Uh, Gatorade. Yeah, Gatorade. Powerade tastes like Coke. Powerade uh, tastes like there's like a, like t it's 10% milk. Yeah. Yeah, it's just definitely got a weird, uh, I like wouldn't a, say milk, but it's got a weird, like, uh, consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Chris Feld says, does a trans woman, chick with a dick, for clarification purposes, understand that it still needs a prostate exam after 40? He likes asking that question a lot. I would imagine. I mean, the whole, I would imagine that once you're going through that situation, 
Like you're, you're. I just pray that this guy never interacts with a trans person ever, <laughs> for their sake. He's actually quite. He's actually quite reasonable. He's just. He, he, he's a strange cat, man. I promise you, if you met him, you'd love him. Yeah, <clears throat> this is the way he is. But uh, yeah, no, I don't know, man. Um, I feel like they, you know, once you're going through that, you'd be paying more, way more attention to your body than you normally do. Plus, Chris, you're like 700 pounds. What are you yeah. doing making health jokes on people? That's funny. I don't know. All right, y'all. That was our outlier podcast. I'm gonna hit the thing because uh, yeah. Follow me at uh, John Man Five Thousand everywhere, and uh, yeah, come see me. And Colton, you want to plug your stuff one more time? Yeah. So I'm at local sex symbol on Twitter and Instagram. Um, you know, I think you should listen to Five Thirty Eight uh, and Doja Cat, and also my album's coming out soon. So follow me on Twitter so you know when that shit comes out. Yeah. That's great. Hey, man, for real, thanks for coming on. This no was problem, really man. fun. Yeah. Like, we, we just blew through three hours. And yeah, I did a great job. Yeah, this was a really good podcast. I really like this. <laughs> All right, so yeah. thanks, y'all. All right, bye.